What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's Dark Waters, and I want to take a moment to put together the entire Dogman presentation for you guys to take a look at. Why? Because as this channel grows, I see the reoccurring theme of, you know, are these stories true? Where do you get your stories? How do you get your stories? This seems like it's fake. Blah, 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 blah. And I know and I understand that a lot of you who've been here for a long time, you know all this information. But for future reference, for those who tend to not understand, those who are lazy, those who, um, you know, they just, they're passive listeners and they don't really pay attention, I need to compile all this in one place for them so they can see and understand what we go through and how we get this information. So I'm titling this Dogman 101 as far as this channel is concerned. It's a compilation of all the data that I have on Dogman, the encounters, how I grade my encounters, the location, the map, the migration patterns, um, and then the various terrains and how those encounters play out on those terrains. It's probably the most comprehensive look at Dogman that anyone's done. I fully anticipate somebody stealing it, but it's fine. I don't give a I When I started doing this, after I had my encounter myself, I really wanted to figure out what it was, where it was moving from, how it was behaving. So I'll know exactly what to expect when I'm in certain locations. Like I can go fishing comfortably uh, in the swamps of Louisiana and not freak out because I know there's certain things that I need to look for. Also, I know when I need to skedaddle and get the hell on because I know there's certain things I need to look for. And there's no doubt in my mind. So I wanted to compile it all for you guys so you can take a listen especially the newbies those who are in the floaties that are in the dark waters you're still on the surface and you just have no clue i always say in my comments this is a channel where it's better to reserve comment on the content until you've consumed a significant amount of it because you make yourself look like a fool and everybody else is looking at you like oh this guy's new he's an idiot he has no clue but the way this channel is set up is designed and it's built you know brick by brick so you can follow everything that happens, whether it be my community tab, whether it be my Facebook page that I used to be on. Everything was built brick by brick. So you can go back and follow through and find information that you want and have a greater understanding. So you get to decide how deep you want to dive into dark waters. You don't just get thrown in that water. Some people just decide they want to swim on the surface. Other people want to dive deep. It's up to you. But the roadmap and the to get to that location that you want is there for you. You have to choose that roadmap. You have to choose how much knowledge and understanding you want or whether you just want to be entertained by a scary story or if you want to get to the bottom line truth of what's going on. I offer all of it, but it's your decision. So what's up, ladies go. and gentlemen? It's your boy, Dark Waters. I know this is an early stream. I'm not even looking at the chat because I don't think anybody's going to show up. But at the same time, let me get a sip of this. But at the same time, this is one of the things on my dog man to do list, which is to um, disclose the information that I've come across about the sightings and what I've discovered and kind of give you guys a breakdown. So if you listen to this later, that's cool. It's all good. I didn't feel like pre-recording this, so I just did it live and I'm going to share this information with you. Now, if you remember over the website, you know why. Um, I've already disclosed why I'm actually releasing all of this. Um, and I explained to the members, I haven't had opportunity to explain to people on YouTube, the reason why I'm releasing all this information is because I'm 100% certain now that the spiritual aspect to this particular entity is so strong that me holding on to information is a form of idol worship. And I need to dump it and get it out there to the public. And then you make up your mind what you go, what you want to do. Can you guys in the chat hear me? I'm, it looks like you can hear me, I'm pretty sure, because I see it binging, binging, bada binging, bada booming. Um, and so I'm going to go into my Dogman sighting map that has been private for a very long time, what I've discovered and what I believe is going on. Uh, what I believe is going on when it comes to these creatures, um, their migratory patterns, why people are seeing them, um, when they're seeing um, them, and if you want to see them and you're a fool, how to go find them? I don't suggest you do that, but hey, you know, that's up to you. So 
let me um, make this big for you guys and I should be able to gotta forgive me I'm smoking a cigar while I do this she'll be able to go back over here and zoom in and you guys will see the zoomed in portion let's see if it act because I'm sharing that screen so let's go back here let's see if it zoomed in awesome all right so I don't need to do anything from there now of course my phone rings of course that's how it works when I'm on doing something and it will not stop ringing so let's turn this ringer off sorry about that guys all right so <clears throat> I'm gonna put this map out there but when you see this map and you see the X and the number next to it that's the number of sightings that I've had from those areas when you see a X and then you see a letter like an A plus um, that means that that sighting involves law enforcement um, and I consider that an A plus sighting Outside of the A-plus sightings, I'm not tracking regular A's and B's um, because the A-pluses, to me, are the most significant thing of all. That means there's somebody who's in law enforcement that I personally have known for years or is a connection to me through someone I've known for years that got the information to me. Um, and it it's so significant that there's no way I can ever doubt that. All right, so I've said in the past um, that... When it comes to dogman encounters, there's a migratory pattern. And people didn't understand why I was saying it or how I came to that conclusion. They just automatically assumed that, oh, I heard this from somebody. I, I speak from experience, and I'll share something with you now. The only part of this pattern I haven't been able to figure out is this section right here, where we're into Utah, um, into the Colorado area, because for some reason, right through here, I've gotten no phone calls from anybody now let me pause and go back to you guys and make sure you understand all of these sightings have not been turned into stories all of them are worthy of being stories but again when i tell you i have a lot of dog man content i'm gonna dump i'm gonna dump a lot of when i'm done i'm dumping everything it's all gonna be out there but let's go back to how i actually get my sighting so there's two ways there's from the audience members who call me or email me and then we end up talking via the phone and then the second way is I run ads in small town newspapers. Now, if you've been following me for a long time, you've seen those ads that I posted on Facebook where I showed where the ad was ran in a Mississippi newspaper or a Kentucky newspaper or a Alabama newspaper, right? It doesn't cost a whole lot of money to do this. It just takes the time and effort. You can get an ad in that paper for 45 bucks. It'll run for a weekend or two weekends or four weekends for 100 bucks. And then you'll start receiving phone calls. Um, and so I started placing ads all over the United States, seeing anything creepy in the woods, seeing anything scary in the woods. I'll pay you to share your story. And so um, outside of my sightings that come from people who actually call me via the Dark Waters phone number um, from YouTube and from interviews, the other way that I receive content and stories is from those ads that I place in the paper. Again, like I tell you all the time, real over fake. I mean, literally, I put the effort into getting you the guys the stories in it. You understand it when you hear the content, right? So over the past two years, I have placed ads in, uh, let's see, in this entire area. Yeah, literally this entire area. Salt Lake City, outside, yep, Fish Lake. Literally, this entire freaking area, Prince and... For whatever reason, I haven't received a phone call in reference to Dogman. So I don't know if it's the understanding of maybe they don't talk about it in this particular area, unlike some of the other areas, or maybe there's nothing going on. I haven't been able to figure that out. So that I want you guys to understand why there's this gap right here. Um, it's just nobody's contacting me. I don't place ads anywhere up in here. I believe that this is well documented i mean extremely well documented in wisconsin and so to me it's like in in a waste of money and time and energy energy to do that because linda has documented this i mean in depth you know what i'm saying like there's no need to document that you just take what i have and combine it with they have and you have a complete picture so that would be a waste of resources so that's why you don't see anything there um i have placed ads 
in upstate New York, um, Maine, and Vermont, but nothing. So I don't know if they don't go that far up. I don't know if they don't. I mean, I just I haven't gotten anything. Um, so anyway, back to the map. So this area here, which is the Appalachian Trail, where they loop back around uh, and come either down through Louisiana and over into Florida. I haven't figured it out how they do this because there's a few sightings through here. Um, there's a sightings that's on this border right here. And this 15 is not really accurate. I need to update that. But, I mean, there's a shitload of sightings that go literally right along the Sabine River all the way up to here. And then they split out and they go this way. And then they go that way, headed up to the north. That's northeast, right? Um, so what I've been able to surmise is that these things are migrating from the south, meaning south of our border, into North America and they make a migratory loop and it's a very very wide loop and the only I can only guess and surmise that there's a contingent of them that are here in Canada across our northern border and I guess maybe when it starts to get cold they start working their way down but again I haven't been able to make the connection but it's not a far leap to make the connection that they probably go through here or they probably go through here I mean, it's just not a far leap. But I, I've already established clearly that they move through the national forests and national parks. I mean, it's, it's it's evident based on all of the phone calls I've had and all the people I've talked to. So if you're looking for a dog man encounter, if you're looking to verify a dog man encounter, um, if you're looking to find dog men, the most dangerous place, in my opinion, for you to go would be anywhere here along our border because these are very, very aggressive, um, insane encounters that come here. I don't know why it's that way. I don't know if it's because they're transversing from wherever they're coming from. Maybe there's a, a lack of food on the way. You know, maybe there's a, a, a section of uh, terrain that they have to transverse where they don't get enough calories and so when they get into this area they're hungry and they just go insane i'm not sure that's the only thing that's the only conclusion i could kind of come to because when you start getting in other areas like for example these uh a lot of these encounters outside of albuquerque new mexico they were real passive encounters like all through here were very very impassive like oh i saw it it looked at me it stood up and it went on about its business it didn't bother me and i'm thinking that there's points in this journey where they're traveling for whatever reason that they kind of hit food deserts. I know. Well, let me let me stay let me stay with this because I want to let me keep my thoughts straight. That they kind of hit food deserts, and it could be based on the terrain. If you look at the terrain here, it's very rocky, very hilly, very mountainous. Um, until you get into this areas where there's going to be an abundance of food. We know this terrain south of the border. Is Mexico is freaking terrible, right? We know that because of the, the migrant waves that are coming and what they go through to get here. So it seems as if once they get around food sources, their demeanor changes. Their demeanor changes. Their demeanor changes. Then when they get into these areas like here, where, again, you have food sources, but you don't have the national forest protected areas where they can just roam and do what the hell they want to do, again, you start seeing them get aggressive, 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 aggressive. Um... In this area, there are aggressive encounters, but they're nowhere near as aggressive as down here on the border. And that's, and again, this is me speculating. I don't have one, like, tied up and put a muzzle on his mouth where I can translate and communicate with them. But this is what I've, the conclusions that I've come to over the past five years of doing research on this. Um, what was the, I had lost the point. What was the other point I was going to make? Um, okay. When we get into this area right here, which is follows the Appalachian Trail, this is where you're going to, if you do your own research, not listen to nobody else, not listen to some interviews, if you do your own research, I'm telling you how to do this. If you start placing ads in papers and gathering contact information from people and making phone calls, the reason why it's important to get away from the YouTube phenomenon of 
excuse me, to get away from the YouTube phenomenon of dog man encounters, meaning like the concept of people having a dog man encounters because it's polluted to a certain extent with people who want to get attention. And if you're not conscious of the fact that it's polluted with narcissistic, you know, um, type A personality people who want attention, then you'll be fooled and you won't get to the real, you just won't get to it. But if you understand that and you go directly to people who you have to convince to talk to you or they're calling you like skeptical of, hey, man, like a lot of phone calls I get are people like skeptical, like, hey, are you really paying money for stories? You know, who are you? Blah, blah, blah. I had one guy tell me I work for the government. And I said, dude, you got to go listen to my shit and you'll see that I don't work for the government. It took him to go find my Facebook page with um, images of me at a freaking crawfish brawl for him to realize that I wasn't like some federal agent. And then he started, started sharing his stories with me. A lot of the things that you guys see me do where, you know, I would shoot some stupid random video with at a crawfish boil or um, show myself going to a location. It's not only it was a twofold thing, not just about me going to the location to set up the camera, but people actually need to know who they're talking to in order to trust you. You know, because once you get into these areas right here where people are deep off in the freaking woods, like, first of all, I'm black. Second of all, I'm putting the ad in the newspaper. And finally, of all, I'm finally, when you do talk to me, I'm nowhere near what you would expect a black person to, to talk like. You know, I communicate differently. I'm not, I don't communicate like the average black person. And so it's, it confuses people like, what the who am I talking to? And I have to break down those barriers and those walls, even though they contacted me, to break down those barriers and those walls and get them to communicate with me. So I've been able to surmise. That this is their migratory pattern. I've been able to surmise that through here. Um especially up through this area going up either breaking off going through top of louisiana mississippi across alabama through tennessee into the appalachian trail and um through here they heard deers along with them literally herds of deers like tons of freaking deer are herded through areas and that's why when you get to places like virginia where my partner um Connor is there'll be times where Connor doesn't have deer around other times deers are abundant and you see that same phenomenon associated with dog man all the way through here and I believe what ends up happening is when they get in this area and they start working their way back around and they know they're going to hit a food desert they try and herd food with them across those areas there's a report that came from in this area where the guy had saw a load of deer being herded by dog men but the deer were red fur deer, which came from south of the border. And it was like 20 or 30 of them, right? But you got to understand, we're talking about an animal that needs a significant amount of calories. And if you got more than one of them, 20 or 30, ain't, it's really nothing for them. So I've come to the belief that the behaviors of these creatures are not only just associated with their personality types as individual creatures, um, but also their cal caloric intake needs. And what I mean by that is just like a human being around, you ain't ate nothing for three, four days. You pissed off, you angry, you mad, you will act out of character and do some like out. And that's why people feel like they see a dog man be like, it'll, it felt, I felt like it was about to eat me. It wanted to eat me. And something was keeping it from doing that. But if you put yourself in a situation where you're all alone in the wrong place in the wrong time, it will eat your ass. But for the most part, that explains why people have these encounters where it's like, yo, I saw this creature, you know, it scared me off. It gave me this look. It did this because at the end of the day, they're trying to go on about their business. They're not there to chew. They're there to do whatever they want to do. But if you're stupid enough to bother them and mess with them, then they're going to handle their business just like, you know, anybody else, you know, live and let live. But you want to play games, that's going to be your ass. So I'm looking and I'm going to keep updating this. I'm looking to fill in this gap. Upon filling in this gap right here and understanding the migrant, I can already assume, I think I can safely assume that they're moving down through here and back that way, back that way, And but all of it's going down this and crossing the border. Why they move this way and this way along the border, I have no clue. But I think it's safe to assume that they're definitely coming through 
from Canada through here down through here. Now, there have been um, some dogman encounter stories that I've heard that are in, you know, the Pacific Southwest. Um, I've had one or two that I did out here. Um, those were decent stories. I, I, they weren't of the caliber that I think needs to be mentioned in this, and it just wasn't enough of them to where um, they need to even be established as a migratory pattern over there because it just wasn't enough. I mean, I think I've had one from... Um, no, that was a panther story that Eric told me. And the other one was a Bigfoot story. There was one from uh, where a dog man chased a car in California. There was another one where, um, God damn, that's like five years ago. There was another one where it was looking through a woman's window in California. Um, is it possible? Absolutely. Do I have enough data points? No. And this is all about my data points that I'm sharing with you. You can feel free to share this. You can feel free to take a screenshot of this, put it wherever the hell you want. Excuse me, because I'm moving, like I told you, I'm moving beyond dog, man. Now, a very interesting thing I'll share with you guys about this area here where, um, I forgot what it's called, but it's like the biggest freaking swamp in Florida. Um, there's some very aggressive activity in this area. Uh, Everglades? Exactly, Everglades. There's a aggressive activity in this activity in this area, but it's all associated with them hunting food it's literally all associated with you interfering with them hunting food period now i don't know if it's clans i don't know if it's family groups but this is territorial here this is not migratory in this everglade area this is territorial and i believe what blue encounter which is over here in fort pierce like this is daytona beach miami orlando where's miami miami um, so we become north of Miami. Fort Pierce is like right up in here. I believe what he encountered was um, maybe some of these migrating or maybe something migrating down to this area, to this Everglades area, because this is Miami. Fort Pierce is like right up in here. Um, yes, yeah, literally like right there. And I think that's what he encountered. So you have two different things going on. You do have stationary groups. That are territorial. I believe that's what's happening also in um, this south area, south of Louisiana, and the Homa, Booty, all those areas. And then you have migratory patterns where things are moving and going for whatever reason. I can't tell you the reason why they're migrating. I I would assume they migrate like every other freaking animal, based on food needs and based on weather. What I do know now is we're getting to the point to where you should see people should see sightings of them in these areas down here and as they're moving out of the north heading south you should get sightings along the sabine river you should get sightings everywhere along the border you'll probably get a sightings in the three corners which will be louisiana texas and um tennessee yeah right in this area yeah and that's where you should get sightings now what I would be interested in knowing is if over this next winter, when things started getting cold, and I'm going to go back and advertise here again, um, if there's any stragglers that come out. I might be a little bit too late. I probably need to do that like right now, August, September, October. So I need to have it in there by this month to run for next month. By October, November, it'll probably be too late. But I need to have those ads running in this area like pronto in order to see if I can get anything else. And for those of you who wish to be researchers, you got to understand, like, the concept online of research is not true research. I mean, it really isn't. So the online concept of research is I get a Facebook group and I get a whole bunch of people in my group. Excuse me. And those people tell me what they saw. Again, you're going to experience pollution in the, that data point because we know that there's a significant amount of people in the dog man community who have a couple of screws loose. They want attention. They listen to other interviews. They make up stories. So those are those are polluted data points. So you cannot go with that. 
you have to put effectively you really want to put boots on the ground but there's no way for me to freaking put boots on the ground and goddamn uh and wyoming and casper wyoming that just doesn't make any sense right it makes more sense for me to coerce and try and get people to talk to me by placing an incentive in front of them for them to pick up the phone and call me so if you want to be a real researcher, and this goes to like the American dogman groups that call me, oh, Dark Waters, can we get your sightings and blah, 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 blah. And I've told people over and over, it's not the sightings that you need to worry about. It's how you get the sightings. And I'm giving it to you now. You need to invest the money in marketing in order to communicate with people who are completely cut off from the whole dogman phenomenon. Because those are going to be your witnesses that are the most credible they there's no pollution they haven't heard the term dog man they have their own terminology for it they have their own belief system associated with it it's not polluted by what everyone else is saying and that's what you want to find that's how you determine um that's how you get to the truth and it's data points period all freaking data points now even here there are definitely sightings that i have through here but for the purpose of showing you guys the the pattern that's all out, remember, there's a radius in which these things roam, right? So I don't think I can do it. Um, it's kind of hard to explain it, but it's not hard to explain. Let me, let me stop saying that. That's not hard to do. So, and it's not hard to show this to you, so I'm going to try and show it to you right now. All right, let's see. Um, let's take a look at this chat. Wow, it's 200 people in here. I wasn't even paying attention to how many people, guys. All right, so let me add another screen here. And I'll, because I'm, I need to think from the, the, the perspective of the assholes that I deal with in the community, right? Um, and the naysayers. What I'm trying to express to you is this. Just because you see this image here doesn't mean that it's an exact move this way. These guys have a radius in which they they can roam throughout a day, uh, throughout the time of a day. I mean, a day's period of time. So if it, if I was being more accurate, I would come here and let's see. Um, I would take a circle. I'm glad I pulled this up because. Um, and I would. Uh, I'll take that circle I would make it something like this I would make it like this and then I would come from this center point let me make sure this is right draw a fill shape and I would take this and I would do something you can't really see that hold on let me change that color can't see that you can definitely see the blue all right so if we're being accurate this is how you would how do you move this this is how you would um accurately depict the radius in the range in which these things can move because they have to sleep they have to stop they have to do things so don't treat it as a linear straight line like oh they definitely going this way you have a radius and uh, that they roam and so for example uh if you and, and this is the most accurate you're probably gonna ever find if you take this encounter and you and it's there on the sabine river this is still their roaming radius so you may have an encounter way over here in alexandria because they can roam that far if that makes sense to you guys so um i want to communicate that to you clearly like they have a daily radius in which they're going to be able to roam based on the number of calories that they need to consume. So we have to, you have to think about these things from that perspective. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure maybe someone has broken it down like this. Maybe someone hasn't, but I just want you guys to have a clear understanding of what I'm saying to you. So it, let me go back. Um, so for example, a freaking dog man and count a dog man here may roam all the way up into kansas in search of food 
and then head back down and hit this trail. But may roam way up here because it's hungry. I mean, literally roam way out here within a day's time, two days' time. And then say, oh, I'm home, I'm not finding food, I'm roaming back here and get to this trail and go and do what it needs to do. So, but I want to get this on the record for you guys because this is information that needs to be out there, period. Um, it needs to be out there, it needs to be public. From a safety standpoint, people need to know and understand these things. Um, you're looking at August, July, August, September, late October for migrating, what I believe, migrating back down southward um, to get away from this cold weather. As we're going into this um, grand solar minimum where we're going to find our winters being colder and more intense, which is what you saw last year, my belief is that you're going to see more sightings, you're going to see less sightings definitely going to see less sightings over here you're definitely going to see less sightings through this area you will find more sightings in the south and along the border where things will be warmer and then at some point in time it's going to get so cold where you should not have any sightings whatsoever like one of the things i um one of the questions i always ask people when they when they're sharing their encounter with me is what time of year it is based on their location i know where dogmen should be so if you tell me it's February 2020, 21, and you're like, yeah, I'm in freaking Milwaukee or outside, and, and you're like, yeah, I saw a dog, man. Like, I saw five dog, man. Like, dude, that just doesn't add up to me. It makes no sense. There's no data that I've received. There's no data points, no stories, no phone calls, no anything that correlate to them being in that location during that time of year. Um, and then... I would chunk down again and I want the description. And if they say, oh, it was a black, you know, jet black dog man with with short fur. No, you lying. Now, if you're telling me like the gentleman shared with me way over here. Hold on. How do I get to this? Um, where he saw a freaking shaggy white dog man. Uh, wherever that park is. Where he saw a shaggy white dog man in the winter with long freaking hair that was white that blended in with the snow, clearly this thing had adapted and it was a cold weather version of whatever the hell everybody else is seeing. I can I can go with that. You know what I'm saying? And he wasn't lying. You know what I'm saying? He just told me what he saw. And I looped him and twisted him and spun him around and tried to trick him. He's like, ah, dude, I'm just telling you what I saw. You know, it was huge. It was shaggy. It was white. It blended in with the snow. It was the scariest thing I ever seen. I don't know what else you want from me. I'm just telling you my story. It scared the hell out of me. So... Those are the kind of things I want you guys to consider, not only when you're listening to stories and encounters, but when you're um, in interviews. But if you decide you want to research this, and I've, I've, I've been a proponent for a very long time that need, there needs to be more people inside of this topic, researching this topic. Sorry, guys, my nose is a little stuffy. And I'm smoking a cigar like a retard, but it is what it is. Um, but I want you to have a deep understanding and a deep dive into the methodology of what you need to do to actually get a real encounter period you you can't it can't just be oh i talked to a guy on youtube or um i had a guest from a dog man chat room or um a dog man reddit and there's nothing against those guys because there are people in there with true stories but you do have to understand that there's a context in which these conversations happen and so imagine a box right just draw a box on a piece of paper with big solid black lines and then draw a lid on that box and there's constantly people putting stuff into the dog man box and it's and it's constantly being fed from the dog man media sources whatever whichever one it may be i mean it could be me it could be vic Cundiff, it could be wolf it could be jeff nataloni because you constantly got this conversation going on and it's but it's all happening inside of that box and then there's these ideas and concepts coming in well if you want to get to the truth you have to take that box and just push it off the table and then go to a whole nother area where there's no box and then now I'm getting real credible information and you apply the same concepts of looping and um, interjecting and 
multiple phone calls, multiple conversations to people who have absolutely no clue that this is a phenomenon. They have abs this is just some that they're dealing with. And they're like, man, I don't know what the hell you call it. I don't know why you call it that. It don't look like a dog man to me. It looked like a damn wolf man, looked like a werewolf. And, you know, but they have their own concept, their own terminology for what they describe these things as. And that terminology is different based on certain areas of the country. So that being said, I got a couple of minutes to take questions and I got to get over here and handle business for my members and get them squared away. If you haven't become a member over at imdogwaters.com, this is what we're going into right now. I know you guys love the cable guy story, but we're starting another story on the website, which is not hitting YouTube because the website, because YouTube is turning to a dog man channel because when I dump the good, nobody won't listen to it. They don't want to listen to dog man. I'm cool with that. So we're going into another really today. We're going to go into another really hardcore gangster story, um, which is based on true events here locally that are still going on based on people that I'm associated with. And I have, and I like I've told the members, this is going to be split up, twisted up, names change because these dudes is dudes I know. Like, I know them, period. Like, I can get in a car and drive over and talk to them right now. Um, the girl who's I'm going to talk about who was just recently indicted and arrested, like, literally, I saw her a month ago. You know what I'm saying? But she grimy. Um, so, but we're going to get into that. We got what I believe to be one of the best humanoid alien encounters coming over there this week. Um, we have another, um, I'm working on getting a, a dog man interview with a gentleman whose family actually poisoned dog man. He found the bones, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, there is, God, there's so much stuff that I'm doing. Um, oh, there's another story about a master thief that I actually talk to based on one of my street connections and this dude really is a master thief like he this he does is crazy you know what i'm saying it's gangster um and i'm just over there you're gonna get a load of content over here you're gonna get a whole bunch of dog man content and that's cool if that's what you're into this is gonna be the place for you to be i'll do some promo stories to entice you guys to come over if you come over cool you don't you don't but i'm telling you if you like what what you're hearing here you need to be over there it's i am darkwaters.com I am darkwaters.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'll take a few questions and I'm out of here. Let's see. I just saw this young lady's question. I didn't mean to show that. I went to show this. I think um, the old man is pretty well documented in the Illinois and Wisconsin by Linda Godfrey. Um, you ain't gonna handle dog man in Chi Town itself. Like somebody told you something like that, beautiful. They line their ass off. But in Illinois, yes, absolutely. Um, I don't like how this thing works because it doesn't keep up with the chat. All right, let's see. It keeps highlighting the wrong. Someone asked about a dog man expert in Australia. Yes, there is a guy, but he was associated with me through um, D Dawes. D Dawes should be getting out the bang in less than 15 days. D Dawes, and when he comes out, he's coming over here with me. Let me address that now for the Dog Waters family. It's going to be some pop when D Dawes come back. So just, I'll tell you, put your on, because it's going to be some pop. And I give zero about people's opinions. Because the one thing I've learned about these communities is this, like, everybody's, there's a lot of finger pointings in this community, right? Um, a lot of people who like the pulpit, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, they on a soapbox in a pulpit, you're this kind of way, you're that kind of way, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're that. But because the person's a public figure, they can do that. But if we looked into their personal life, they masturbating fornicating, cursing, drinking, hollering, smoking, doing all the same. Um, and I'm a, I'm a person that believes in friendship. If I rock with you, I rock with you, period. And he ain't the first friend that I had that set, had to go sit down. He ain't going to be the last friend I've had that had to go sit down for something. Now, as a friend, I got to call, hold you to the car, the carpet and you got to talk about that. But just cause you made a mistake or you did some fouls, which all that's up in the air, how it went down. 
don't mean that you need to be ostracized from society. That's what happens to black men all the time. And on my watch, that's not happening to that brother. And if you got a problem with it, then you got a problem with me. And I don't give a who you are. I want to be clear. I don't give a who you are. We can go to war. And I will. So sit your ass in the corner and shut up. Or let's pull out your sword and let's go ahead and chop each other's heads off, you dig? All right, let's get to the next question. Um... I think empty parts below the Appalachian Trail is Bigfoot territory because Atlanta had a lot of Bigfoot living right next to people. I'm in Macon, Georgia. Uh, I know they was in my old house. I think I know who you are, bro. I think we talked on the phone. Um, and we, we still need to talk about you doing your channel. <clears throat> it may be Bigfoot territory. What's significant about... Um, what's significant about this map is you will find that a lot of these areas are areas where Bigfoot are, but they're vast areas as well. So there's room for both of these creatures to coexist and stay out of each other's way. Um, there are certain areas where they don't get along at all really well, and that's really around the three corners. They don't, they, they be beefed out up there. Like, they be bugging, going at it. I don't know why. I, I, I think it may be, in my opinion, again, only in my opinion, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think it may have a load to do with um, the lack of food that may manifest itself in these areas to where they get here to where it's this extreme competition for food. And so when you're in an area where there's a lack of food or maybe it's a meeting point where I don't know if Bigfoot migrates. I haven't really focused my attention on Bigfoot like I have on Dogman. And if there's a Bigfoot expert, he may say, well, you know, Bigfoot moves here, here. My, my belief is that Bigfoot's are more territorial. Um, then dog men, I have not gotten, nope, not one report of Bigfoot on the border at all. No. So I believe they're more territorial. Like they chilling, posted up, got their little areas, got their little stick structures, whoop de woo. Maybe those stick structures to let other freaking dog men and other entities know, don't come over here. This is my spot. You know what I'm saying? We don't know. But what I can tell you is this, and I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper. What I can tell you is this. There's areas where they beef, and they beef hard. I believe that the only incentive for them to ever have an issue would be food sources or, and what I mean by food sources is like, oh, I'm a hungry dog, man, and I see a, a young juvenile Bigfoot. I'm about to eat that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm hungry, dog. I'm about to take you. That or just food sources in the area in general. But I believe it's, hey, I'm freaking hungry. I'm dog, man. Rrr, I'm hungry. That's your kid. You better keep him close to you. Oh, you got away? Gotcha. Now we got a problem. <clears throat> um, let's go to the next one. Get rid of that. Hopefully it's not freezing. It's not. All right, here's a question that I want to answer for sure. What's the best thing to do if you're encountering one of these creatures? So... Um, Jay, it's a couple of, you have to be a little bit more detailed and chunk down on it. So there's a couple of types of encounters. There's an encounter where you're in passing, right? You're riding in a car, you see a freaking dog, man. Or you're on your job at a construction site, you're there, and you see it off in the bushes, and it runs by, and it goes about its business, right? There's those type of encounters. And then there's the cohabitation encounters where you live on the property, and your property is in an area that's close to where they migrate, and they're there for a while. And the, the key that I want you to understand is they're there for a while. They are, they're territorial for a while. It's not like they're just chilling there and they live in there. They got to move, and they're moving where they need to go. So my advice to you, like I've told other people, just like I told the guy on the live stream, yo, let that thing live. Let it go on about its business. You know what I'm saying? Wait till it get cold. Let it go on about its business. Um, if you have no choice but to defend yourself, defend yourself but don't put yourself in a situation to where you're going to have to do anything aggressive towards these creatures if you can let it go on about its business let it be i mean i don't give a shit if it's coming up to your window looking in the window man let that leave that alone because it's like the schoolyard bully on steroids you know what i'm saying leave it alone let it be but if you have no choice defend yourself but don't go looking for trouble don't go starting don't be like some of these other people who are I have dog man on my property. I'm excited. I'm going to go take a picture. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. No, dog. Chill. 
Because I've told you guys, at the end of the day, and it's perfect. Blue was a perfect example. Blue has probably some of the best dog man photos, video evidence caught on, on film, and his witness encounter where you see all of the emotional spikes that he goes through as a witness after the encounter. His video was vetted by um, the Travel Channel, two shows on the Travel Channel. He made appearances on the Travel Channel on um, Caught on Tape or something like that. And within the community, there were still people who were saying that it's a fake and it's a fraud. And there's still people who are ch twisting narratives. Even though it's been completely vetted, even though thousands of dollars have been paid for his photos that were not released to the public. But it still was treated as if it was a fraud. So it's very important to you for you to listen to this. If you're a person who has an encounter and you actually come upon evidence, it's one thing to have the encounter. That's the first phase. The second phase is dictated by who you associate with upon that encounter and what you do. So if you don't have the right advice around you, if you don't have the right counsel What's going to end up happening to you is you're going to be bombarded with crazies. Your name is going to be drugged through the mud and you're going to regret that experience. It's bad enough to be scared to death. I mean, something frightens you. And for your whole context, your whole mental context, meaning um, what you believe is possible and what you believe that should exist on this planet. Now you completely thrown off because you understand that, holy crap, there's other things out here that I never considered. You're emotionally going through that roller coaster. But what comes next is the human being aspect, the human part of it, which is dangerous and just as aggravating as everything else. And so your counsel that you seek during a time like that is very important. My advice to you is if you have some great photos, some great evidence, reach out to somebody like me, reach out to a Dave Schrader, somebody that's connected that can get you a reward for your evidence that can make sure that it's presented in the right manner, in the right light, to where all the rest of the stuff goes away. And that's what happened with Blue. Because when I saw it happening to him, I said, look, dog, you, you're going to need to handle this this way. Because if not, people are going to harass the shit out of you because they're crazy. Within 24 hours, he was like, yo, these people bugging. I'm like, yeah, I told you, dog. Like, for real. Like, handle it like this. Boom, 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 boom. And then it worked out perfectly for him. And he has, now he, Blue could have chosen to be in the dog man community and talk at him about this because he has one of the best encounters. He chose not to. He said, it's based on what I saw, based on the behavior of the people, based on the things that were sent to me, man, I don't want nothing to do with this. You handle it. Let me talk to the people. I'll take the scratch, but you know, I want it to go away. And see, that's a true witness. That's how you know they witnessed something. They've seen it. They want their life to go back to normal. You understand what I'm saying? So, um, with that being said, let's go to the next question. All right, I'm the Providentia, however you pronounce that, that walked around my car, footprints left, but never harmed. They knew I mean no harm to them, but I'm so not so stupid as to think they wouldn't kill my ass. Yeah, you're smart. You're definitely smart. Um, this is a bad idea though I've gone to that old park many times I always leave treats of some type along with greatest respect I wouldn't be around here leaving nothing for nobody though like that's not a good idea I mean unless it's on your property and you have some kind of understanding, I wouldn't do that. Um, Peaches is asking what percentage of dog man encounters end in death, sweetheart. There's really no way of knowing. Um, and I'll explain to you why. The ones that happen in like the isolated parts of the national forest and on the outskirts of the national forest, those you just never hear from the person. Um, the ones that happen in semi-populated areas and populated areas are quickly covered up. I mean, quickly, quickly covered up. I mean, it's insane, the stuff that they do. So you, we really have no clue. There's no real data point for that. 
and I wouldn't sit here and lie to you and say, oh, 30 percent, because I'd be a lying some bit. And there's just there's no real data points for that. And honestly, sweetheart, I don't know if I personally want to have those data points, because there's some things once you get so deep into them, you step into an arena that's very, very dangerous. I've told you guys about what happened when I was at the other house when people came over to talk to me. So sometimes you get into arenas that are so dangerous that it's not worth the risk. And when you take into account what I've already explained about the behaviors of the community as it pertains to evidence and um, witness treatment, you combine that with, okay, I'm going to go deep dive into you know, how many people have died and really get that. I cannot tell you, could I figure out how I probably could. I mean, if I really sat here and thought about it, I probably could, but it, it's not a benefit to me to deep dive that deep into it, pull out those data points and then, um, and then make them public because at the end of the day, when it hit the fan, like I got a couple of, I got the family that's going to rock with me, but I won't have the whole dog man community come to my defense. If it was a situation where I knew that I would have 100,000 coming to my defense, like, don't you lay a finger on him or we going to ride, then yeah, I would do it. But that, there's no way that's going to happen. So I'm, I'm not even taking that chance. Uh, Alex, that map shows you the areas that get the largest amount of reports. That red area. Is, that's highlighted in red is where the largest amount of reports are. Um, Kathy, you you hit a, a great hit on a great question. Sorry, I had to scratch my ear. You're gonna hear a little noise from the microphone. Kathy M H, do you think that Dogman, Bigfoots, aliens, and the missing 411 are connected in some kind of way? So first of all, I can't speak on Mr. Pilates research. Because I haven't really done a lot of research on his research. I don't know the gentleman. I don't know anything about him. So I can't speak on what he's done. I'm familiar with what the conclusions are that he's come to. And that's great. I mean, I think he's a very smart man. Because he walked up to the line and shared information with you guys. And put his toes on the line and didn't cross it. And I think that's a smart thing to do. But here's what I'm going to share with you that probably, again, nobody else is sharing. If... And this didn't come out publicly because of the behavior of the very first pictures. So it didn't really hit the public. I may have shown this picture and I just let it go because people were, again, acting like different retarded. So in blue sets of photos, um, his second or third set of photos, three or four days after that dog man encounter, um, he photographs a Bigfoot in the trees. You can clearly see the brow, the nose, the jaw, the thin lips. It's a freaking Bigfoot. But when you look, that didn't freak him out. That didn't freak me out. What the freak does out was this other thing that was there up higher in the tree that had manifested itself that looked to us like uh, some kind of female um, entity. We couldn't, I mean, it looked like an ugly ass woman is what it looked like, right? This is something that Bigfoot researchers and dogman researchers, like real in the field researchers probably know, but they don't speak on it. And it's because it's just not wise for them to speak on it because of the behaviors in the community. It almost seems like, and I'm just going to put it out there to y'all just like this. It almost seems like every time there's a dogman Bigfoot encounter where they're photographically caught in evidence um, that there's something else with them. And I've come to the conclusion based on the conversations that I've had with people who've seen not only a Bigfoot and a dogman or they've seen an orb with it or they've seen some other weird with it that um, it's kind of like. There's there's a, a force. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you call it. I don't know what they are. But there's something that is restraining these entities from doing everything they want to do. It's almost like, you know how you have your, your kid when you have a little baby and you get that little plastic fence, right? And 
you know, you put the fence around the area because you know the toddler's going to come around and walk over and put a fork and a light switch, try and climb on a cab. Then a, you put this little fence around, right? That little plastic fence. It's almost like there's a warden that's with them that's like, look, you can do this, you can show yourself, but you, you got to chill out. Like something is keeping them in check. And if you, um, if you go and you listen to any of the researchers like that are field researchers and just listen to what they say you understand that what i'm saying to you is true they'll talk about you know i I got evidence of a bigfoot but there was some other weird with it we don't know what that was and then you hear these researchers talking about portals open up and things coming out of portals i'm not saying that these i'm not saying that they're definitely intimate interdimensional beings but there's something more to this than um than what we're focusing on. Like right now, everyone is fascinated with dog, man. You're not fast. You're not digging deeper to figure out what's really going on. You're in the state. A lot of people are in a state of worship where they're idolizing this dog, man entity, but never really asking the question, well, what the really restrains them from just wilding? Like what stops them from just like, yo, I'm here. You know what I'm saying? I'm eating all you. What stops that? They could do it. We know they real, but what's blocking them from doing that? You know what I'm saying? So, I submit for the record, I this is what I feel like it is. Like, there's a force, an entity, maybe something more powerful than them that's like, yo, y'all can y'all can roam and do what y'all need to do, but you you gotta stay within this range. And you gotta you can only do A B C. And I submit to you that when people have um very, very negative encounters that either that force is not active or that force is not there or somehow you're actively you actively attacking them kind of removes whatever bondage or chains they're on and allows them to defend themselves and act a fool with you because at that point in time you notice they start terrorizing people i mean completely terrorizing people the guy who called in on the last um live stream gentlemen i, I still excuse me i still need to chop it up with him they was around doing what they need to do. He, he, the minute he started being offensive, it was like, I'm going to go pour some coyote urine or something, whatever he poured over there, dog urine or whatever it was. Oh, they lost their damn mind. Um, and so there's something else going on there. I don't know if it's aliens. I don't know what it is. I can't quantify what it is at this point in time. Maybe I'll shift and do a deep dive and kind of look into that. But um, there's something else going on, clearly. And that needs to be a part of this narrative that's being left out. And a lot of stuff is left out of the dogman narrative because you guys as a community don't demand more. And you don't demand, like, you accept what people throw at you. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, this guy threw this out. You just accept it and you run with it. You have to demand more from people in order to get more answers. You as a community can move the topic forward by demanding more information demanding more people looking at things in more in in depth more you know what i'm saying but as researchers and interviewers they're only going to give you what you're willing to consume your consumption dictates what is actually produced so like it's up but you kind of digging the hole and you're digging it in that direction like you've dug a you dug a cave, right? And the treasure is to the left, but you're digging right. And you keep digging right, keep digging right, keep digging right. And people are gonna give you what's in the direction that you want it to go. So they're gonna give you what you want. You know what I'm saying? They're not gonna necessarily give you the truth. They're gonna give you whatever you're gonna consume. And they're gonna look and say, Okay, well I'm gonna make this amount of money if I give you this. And so they're just gonna get that to you. You have to dig in the opposite direction. You know what I'm saying? You have to reward people who dig in the opposite direction. Um to get down to the bottom line and that's how you as a community truly get to the truth is you have to be conscious of what you're doing conscious of what you're watching conscious of what you're consuming because you actually dictate what people produce now for me personally the reason why i did my own website is because i didn't want to be trapped into the dog man trap because i saw it from the beginning i wanted to talk about everything and i've been talking about everything and that's why i say if you want to hit other that's out there that's wild I am dogwaters.com. You want a little dog, man? It's going to be here until I run out. When I run out of dog, man, I don't know what the hell is going to be here. 
I might go into Giants. I might go into something else, and then and that's going to be that. But um, you guys have the ability to get to the truth as a community, and you have to understand your power as a community. You guys understand it as a, a community to troll people and with people. Like, you know, people. y'all understand that without a problem. You know what I'm saying? Y'all understand the power as a community not to hit the like button and hit the dislike button. But you, that energy that you have, and I'm not talking to my Dark Waters family, so don't get me wrong. Y'all don't around like this. But there's always people in here who don't fool us that listen. That's just what they do. They don't hit the like button. I'm talking to y'all. Y'all dictate the pace of where things go. You know what I'm saying? And it's up to you to get to the bottom. Of it. Quit playing games and say, okay, I want to know about this. And if nobody's doing it, then it's up to you to rise out of the crowd and start talking about it and start making it popular to where people actually start going in that direction. Like, Think about it. When before Siege of Logging Ranch came out, nobody was really talking about dog men attacking people and killing people. That wasn't a part of the narrative. The minute I started sharing that truth, it was like, oh, next thing you know, there was a thousand stories about that. But it was fake. Mine was real. And so now it's a part of the narrative five years later. Don't with these things because they might kill you. Period. Prior to that, nobody wasn't talking about that, man. And they just weren't. Um... They weren't. All right. Anyway. Ruderman says, um, I'm not familiar with who John Carpenter is, but here we go. Uh, where did you go? Here we go. Field and guest investigator John Carpenter caught video and pics of dog man are woven with alien looking creatures on its shoulders. Does this make sense? Like if you go back and you look at the photo on my Facebook page where you see that freaking Bigfoot's face, it's clearly a Bigfoot, and you see that other thing, you like, what the hell is that thing? What is that? I mean, you could clearly see, and it's way bigger, way taller, and it's spooky. So there's levels to this stuff that we can dive into as a community we just have to want to dive into it and that's the most important thing we have to want to get that knowledge and obtain that knowledge if we don't want it then you're not going to get it and that's just the honest to god truth you're only going to get what you demand and um and that's going to be that pimp that's all there's to it any more questions before i end this stream and get back to handling my bi isness you know what I'm saying? Let's get that fixed up on this computer while we're doing it. Any more questions? John Scott Carpenter, not John Carpenter. Okay. Bigfoot and Dog Man Alien Experience. Dog Path wants to know if they're alien experience. Experiments. Why am I doing that with words right now? Um... So that's a question that could be answered in multiple ways. Depends on how deep you are into the bar the term from my friend Cliff High in the woo of things. Um so genetic modification being done by humans is on record. It's documented on record. A couple of months ago I went into the Senate bill where um, the Nationalist Party of America was trying to stop the Globalist Party of America from doing genetic modification. It's very key that you understand that I said the Nationalist Party versus the Globalist Party because there's no such thing as Democrats and Republicans. If you're under that impression, then you're crazy. So the Nationalist Party of America was trying to stop the Globalist Party of America from doing genetic modification experiments or halting the existing genetic modification experiments. So we as human beings have been genetically modifying things for a long time, right? So just assume that whatever you see being genetically modified now, somewhere in some lab, in some base or somewhere, there's something that's 100 years ahead of that, right? So um, by proxy, my belief is that we got that knowledge from somewhere, right? The, the knowledge of how to actually do this whether it be an off-world entity through rituals and magic um, 
or whether it be an off-world entity that came here and actually like walked on the ground and was like beep beep boop, 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 beep 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 show me your leader and then they taught him the technology i think either way it goes it doesn't matter you get into the same end result same end result is yeah there's definitely some kind of genetic modification going on now the portal thing i'm not sure of you know the interdimensional thing there's you a case can be made for these creatures being interdimensional a case can be made for them coming through portals because the native americans talk about the stargates literally stargates like off the movie so it, it could be that you know what i'm saying but i'm never going to sit here and tell you i have the definite answer i'm always gonna give myself wiggle room because there's more to learn if, if somebody's giving you a definite answer then you know they they feel like they know everything all right um uh, someone asked us so what are these dog man symbols you need to rewind the video and listen i explained all that to you already um All right, Joe Cage. I think this is significant. A significant question. Joe Gage, not Cage, Gage, says, can either one of them talk? Has anybody ever reported either talking? Either of them. So, we have the Sierra sounds where you hear Bigfoot clearly holding conversations and communicating in whatever language they use. Dogmen, um over multiple stories i've heard about them communicating through yips and yelps not like talking like hey bob come over here or joe you didn't wipe your ass you know what i'm saying but there's definitely some form of communication that's going on between dogmen amongst dogmen i want to be careful with my words amongst dogmen and amongst bigfoot not between the two species but there's definitely a form of communication so um i think you can check that box off and assume that that's true all the evidence points to that i've had people share stories with me where they've communicated to each other all right um i read stories of them topping I don't know what topping means. If topping means like having sex with human beings and women, yeah, they there's been women who've been raped by dogmen. There's been cows who've been raped by dogmen, horses raped by dogmen, and Bigfoot. Um Mr. Mendoza says, Are these things coming to light? Oh, come on, baby, you just be doing me wrong. Are these things coming to light as far as biblical prophecy? You know, in order to really accurately answer that question, someone would have to tell you definitively when the end time started biblically. I'm not a biblical scholar to tell you that. Um, what I will say is this. I believe that although we definitely facing some end time stuff right now, I just think that a lot of what's going on is the advances in technology. Um, the ability for human beings to communicate with each other at light speed is what allows us to share some of our almost intimate details. Like prior to there being a YouTube and prior to there being a Twitter and prior to there being a Facebook, you know, the things that you saw, saw at night in the dark that scared you, if there was no support structure for you to talk to people about it, meaning if there was no one in your neighborhood, um, for you to talk about it or no one within you know a 50 mile radius for you to talk about it you shut up about it right the technology has made it to the point to where people have the ability to communicate with each other and share those scary things that go bump in the night so n by the nature of the technology advancing naturally people are starting to share those encounters and we're seeing more of them um and I think that's very important to understand. Now, as far as the biblical sense, um, then, man, I mean, I, I can't answer that. What I can tell you is, because dogman sightings have been around for a long time, some of these other things that are being reported, that's what's scaring me.
because some of the other stuff that people are seeing, man, it's terrifying. I mean, it's literally terrifying the stuff that I'm I'm talking to people about. And so that's making me think we're close to end days, end times, because these creatures are stuff that, dude, the worst horror movie, like the worst horror movie would love to have some of these stories and be like, yo, we never ever thought of a creature like that. Like this one that I'm going to release to the um to the members about this winged humanoid that like at first i thought to do was talking about mothman but when he described the body i'm like nah this ain't mothman this is something like a flying batman demon from hell with four eyes and with a brain on top of his head that's freaking pulsate like like what the hell is that dude and my man's not lying he's not lying at all i talked to him I talked to the service guy who was there that was like the janitorial guy who was there at the car shop with him that looked out of the window and both of them like, yo, it was huge. And I've never heard of anything like that, ever. All right. Um... Dark Waters, what do you think about the correlation between ancient Egyptian deities, cult of skinwalkers in the southwest? Egyptians came to modern Arizona. Um, so we know that um, in the Grand Canyon they found a significant amount of gold. They found evidence that you know Egyptian civilization was in the Grand Canyon. Um, we know that that civilization one of his deities was Anubis. It wouldn't be a far reach to say there was an association, but I can't speak on that association being di directly connected to the cult of skinwalkers. Um, I just can't because I, I, I don't have the data and I won't speak on it because I'm not sure. But I can see where you're going with it and it would make some sense, but there would need to be some direct correlations. You know what I'm saying? There really would need to be and how what would those correlations look like asher it would have to be go back and find as much information about the egyptians in that area and then the magic that they used and then find if there's a correlation between that magic direct correlation and then what the skinwalkers of native americans uh original native americans used if there's a direct correlation it would be not only there, the direct correlation would be as well in North Africa and anywhere else that you saw that civilization take home. So it would be that they passed down some knowledge from their group to another group. And inherently, it doesn't make sense because if you have an advanced culture um, and then you have like on the peripheral of that advanced culture you have these you know people who are out in the woods you know hunting hunters and gatherers you don't just share that knowledge with them it would have to be stolen like the promethean fire type deal you know what i'm saying you don't you don't just share that with them they're the peasants they're the they're the underlings we're not giving you this this is for us you kind of get what i'm saying so just to kind of point you in a direction and give you a thought process as to how to research i would love to talk about it with you if you do some research feel free to let me know um Uh, wide awake says Amanda said the Lycan loop has signs that say do not get out I'm not sure which Amanda we're talking about I may have missed it um and I'm I know about the liking loop but I haven't spent any time researching it um at all I haven't Oh, this CDC going to around and get hurt. They need to sit their stupid ass down with all these little plans they got. They're going to learn hard. They're going to learn the hard way. All right. Um, I'm trying to find any more questions. I see a lot of statements. Cindy John says, 
there were two people out in the county near Lake Charles told us they seen that flying man around thing just before the Delta hit us. Yeah, I don't know what's up with that flying dude. Like, that's crazy. And it's not like a jetpack either. It's not like he's got, a, like, a jetpack. Homeboy is flying, like, on some straight-up Superman stuff. And it ain't Mothman. And I'm telling you, that ain't Mothman. I don't know what the hell that is. That's completely different than this winged creature that I'm about to share with you guys at the website. I don't know what's up with Homeboy. Because not only has, does he have the ability to fly, but he has the ability, I guess it would be telekinesis? Where you can move, make people feel things and touch things with your mind? Like, I don't know who he is. I, that That's wild. But there's a couple of more reports of him. I'm just waiting for him to hit the news. When he hit the news, then it's going to be like, oh, like people are like, damn, Dark Waters told us about this a year ago or two years ago. This is crazy. Yeah, the homeboy is on some other stuff. Um... Uh, All right, that's another good question. Do I think that only certain people are susceptible to seeing these creatures? First of all, ladies, how are you? Congratulations on your interview. You guys did it. You put on your big girl uh, pants and handled your business, and it didn't turn out to be bad whatsoever. I've been watching to see if there was any trolls, and you guys did good. I told you it was going to be all right. You got to... Um, you got to have a pair on you to make it happen, baby. Don't worry about it. The most people going to do is talk, and there's a few people who may be crazy enough to come see you and you greet them with a shotgun and that's all it is to it and come to your door plug them tell the police hey man i'm a, a public figure this guy showed up in my house i was scared it is what it is right um so to answer that question if we talk about dog man and bigfoot i don't think you particularly as an individual have a choice in deciding it so i think we as human beings like to feel like we can control things, right? So we feel like because we're in control in our environment, which we're quickly learning right now that we have no control of our environment because you're forced to put on a mask, you're forced to not go into, you, you don't really have any control, right? And I think that's the first thing you have to accept. And when you take that same mentality and go into the woods, you feel like you're in control, but actually you're not because you're in a presence of, millions and thousands of predators i mean even bacteria on the ground which is predatory in its nature bugs which are predatory in their nature if you freaking die they eat you alive right but in your mind you believe you're in control so the best way to answer that question is this nobody's particularly susceptible to seeing these things you're at their whim if they want to reveal themselves to you or not or show themselves to you or not you know what i'm saying so um that kind of goes back to my rules of engagement with dog man and Bigfoot and well, really dog man, which is, you know, leave them alone because you're at their mercy. You know, you really, really are at their mercy. Like there's a story about to come out called Roshiba and dog man. And this story, which is going to be on the website probably by next week, literally is going to show how you're at their mercy, no matter how big and bad you are. Like your ass is at their mercy. And you, the best thing to do is leave them alone. All right, this is supposed to go an hour. I'll go 50 more minutes. Then I got. I really got to get back to work. All right. They said there was no jetpack at all. Just flying scared. Then the man teared up, telling us at the hotel in Baton Rouge, we were all evacuated. Uh, yep. I believe what dad told me he took a big bottle of scotch to give him the courage to talk about it that and men possessing themselves with demons to survive the worst areas and get home on finish that statement I would love to um to hear that statement the concept of possessing yourself with a demon kind of leans to perfect possession which means it's not really easy to get rid of that demon yep and that, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like, it's not easy to get rid of that demon if you invite it in. You know what I'm saying? There's a process of possession. You know what I'm saying? It's demonic 
oppression, suppression, then possession. It's not like you just, oop, I'm possessed. I just got possessed. Oh, Lord. Like you, to be perfectly possessed by an entity, you have to invite that entity in. And now that entity has a home inside of you because you use your free will to invite that into you. Right? So they can gradually break you down and wear out your free will and force you to give in. But those people who end up being perfectly possessed actually end up going freaking crazy and nuts. So um, you just got to be mindful. Jenna Oak says she was referred to me by Jeff Nataluzzi. And my boy, Jeff, I talked to him a couple of days ago. I love Jeff. Jeff is a cool dude. And I like the fact that things working out better for him. His dad was going through a bad time. Um, he's doing well. He's a good guy. A lot of these people in the industry are really good people. Rob Johnson says, I have heard or I know of, I know people have reported dogmen as far back as 1,200 years ago. Do you think we're dealing with a different type? Yeah, I think we are. I think we're dealing with, like I've said, genetically modified versions of them that have been captured. And, and think about it. If you found the species of animal that had the ability to live a lifespan of 100, 200 years, when you want to know how they live that long, you know what I'm saying? When you want to know, you know, when you want to know about them, if you were a government with money and you had a black budget fund, a slush fund, wouldn't you want to like capture one of those things and poke around on it and pry it on it and figure out if you can use it for your own good? All right, guys, I think that's it. I'm not seeing any more questions. Yeah, I believe this man. Let's see. Jesus, this is God. I need some air circulating here. It's going straight in my nose. God. I believe that these men seeing things and know things that will probably stop our breathing. I know my dad has never been the same and carries a gun everywhere. Yeah. That's what it tends to do to you, baby. Like real sightings, real people who have real sightings, they, they don't really not have a sidearm with them. They don't. Like I told you guys, in Fort Pierce, Florida, that sighting affected the whole damn neighborhood. I mean, it, it, the whole neighborhood was on pause, like for real. Like, hey, hey, I ain't going outside at night, me either. We go out, we got to go to the store at night. It's 10 of us walking to the store together. Like the whole neighborhood paused for a minute. They really just came unpaused like a couple of months ago where they kind of back to doing their thing. But the whole neighborhood paused for a minute. And honestly, this should be around the time when he had that sighting. You know what I'm saying? Um, it might have already passed. It might have been going on a year already. I might be like a month or two after his sighting, but it just his sighting is right. It correlates right along with the migration of parent times and the times that they're moving to get to wherever the hell they want to go. Well, I would love to know where the hell they go, but in order to do that, there's a language barrier that stops me from doing that, and that language barrier is a language that's south of our border. I just don't I don't speak the language. And so that barrier will stop me from getting that information. If I knew how to speak the language, I guarantee you, I would find out where the hell they're going because it would just be a matter of me marketing into that area. And it would be way more powerful because the, the monetary incentive south of the border is way stronger than it is north of the border. You know what I'm saying? So if I tell you, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars in a small little city where a hundred dollars lasts you for three months oh and all i want is some real accurate from accurate information hell yeah i'm gonna find out what's going on i have people lining up trying to vet through who's telling the truth and who's lying you know what i'm saying but that language barrier stops me from doing that that's another opportunity for somebody in the dog man um community like to do that somebody talking about google translate not nah, do i don't i can't i don't do like i gotta hear your tone i gotta hear you talking to me and i gotta understand the inflections in your voice in order to know what the hell you're talking about. There's no shoot me an email. There's no like written communication to get to the truth. Like I got, I got to talk to you. You know what I'm saying? And if you, if you really, really, if I really, really think you're telling the truth, I got to see you. You know what I'm saying? I need to get on, you know, Google, Google video or Skype or something and look in your eyes to see what's happening. That way I know what the deal is. You know what I'm saying? But very few people even get to that point. 
once you get to that point where I'm trying to Skype you, oh yeah, we need to some you got some going on. You know what I'm saying? So um but the language barrier is gonna prevent that and that's one of the things I have to accept and I'm willing to accept that until I can find someone um that I can trust that's close enough to me that I can trust to hold those conversations. And then I can train that person on how to communicate the way they need to communicate and what to do. Um Answered that question already, Roderick, like three times. I haven't uh, told me about the sighting of Lobo Diablo chasing vehicles near the border again. Happened before in like 06, 08. Um... Oh no! As someone mentioned, ley lines. It's very interesting. If you lay, if you overlay a map of the ley lines on this map, you'll see some very interesting things. Um, I used to have one with it on there, but I, I know I don't because it's on a whole nother computer and a whole nother location, and I don't have remote access to that computer. But you will find some very, very interesting stuff if you're able to do that. We starting to get repetitive questions, man. When people need to, um, when people need to go back and listen. Let me get a pen. And um, Blake, I think we talked before, dude. I'm pretty sure we talked before, like years ago. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to end this stream, make it happen, Captain. Y'all have a wonderful day. Um, there's another, there'll probably be another dog man story come out right after this. So enjoy. Peace. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Dog Waters, and I'm back. Give me one second. Let me adjust this microphone. All right, so I shouldn't be booming too loud. And I'm back with another Dog Man data set drop. Um, before I start on this one, I want to discuss a few things. So, um, as I've said prior um, to this video, going back to the very first video where I showed my map, I explicitly said there are certain areas that I do not even try to gather encounters from because I know this it's well documented so um, I talked about like the Michigan era where area where Linda Godfrey has documented you know dog man sightings out the wazoo right um, and then it was another area where I showed you on the map where I just didn't have any sightings and I told you guys I don't know why bada bing bada boom I need the people listening to understand I'm talking about my data sets from stories and encounters with people I've spoken to. So when you say, oh, well, there's accounts of Dogman in, I don't know, somewhere in 
I don't know, somewhere in Nevada in the desert, and it, it doesn't fit my data set. Yeah, there are accounts of it. Absolutely, there are accounts of them, but I'm only going on my data sets based on the people I talk to. So there may be accounts from other people. I'm only going on what the hell I, I know to be true. So I don't include other people's data into my set because I don't know what process that data went through to be verified. It could be that somebody just called and told somebody a story and that was it. It could be that they got photographic and video evidence. I don't know. So I don't include that in anything, period. Like, because there's no, I haven't touched that at all. You know what I'm saying? So if I haven't touched it, I ain't talked to the witness, I ain't did none of that. You notice I don't even comment for the most part on stuff where um, where the witness, where I haven't talked to the witness. I, I literally try and stay away from that. The only time I started doing that is when Vic Cundams and his asshole started attacking me. And even in that case, I still made it specifically about the host and not the witness and made sure you guys understood that the witness may, be, may or may not be telling the truth. You have no way of knowing because that witness is not publicly interrogated. There's no real follow-up questions. There's no real follow-up after the interview. Bada bing, bada boom. So, um, I've explained this. And I need the new people listening who's picking this up. If you don't understand, go back to the first video and listen to all the videos. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate your comments, but understand, the answers to your questions are there. You just need to go back and listen. You know, everybody wants to take the shortcut and email me. Well, what's this? What's that? No, dude, just listen. I've explained it all. All right, so here we go again. Variations in appearances, and we're going to start talk about eye colors and eye shine. So we're going through the same list of um, the variations in appearances, and I'm going to show to you guys the eye shines that have been reported to me. These percentages are based on what I've been told from my witnesses that I believe are you know, from A plus or A all the way to C minus witnesses. Like these are good, solid witnesses who've been questioned over and over again um, in order to get this information. So when you look at this graph, you're going to notice that there's um, a red eye shine with a red pupil. You're going to see, like in this first case, we're talking about the black wolf appearance, both the muscular and the slender black wolf appearance. We go into the percentages. So we have the far left, we have 31% of the um, the eyes have this red pupil surrounded by a pinkish or more so reddish eye. Now, one thing I want to note about these that particular eye shine color, it's the equivalent of you shining a light. It's more nocturnal. So it's you shining a light into the animal's eyes. It pupils, it's pupils reflect that red color, um, which I believe in return make the irises, makes the color kind of spread over the iris and makes the the rest of the eye look red. It's not necessarily that that pupil is red, it's just that shine makes it illuminate red, right? And then the next one we have at 22% is the amber and the orange. You will hear all the time people say that, you know, I saw this dog man and his eye shine was this amberish, kind of orange or amberish yellow uh, orange color right um 22 percent of my encounters have been that the bulk of them have been when it comes to this black wolf appearance really the bulk have been this huge black people with yellow eyeballs i mean huge i mean it, it, extremely huge seven percent have been the red eyeball with a black uh, pupil and then the rest of them have been a white eyeball with just black people. Um, again, it's it should be noted in this data set that when we start talking about eye shines, that nocturnal eye shine runs pretty consistent across the board. That, But we're not talking about, in these cases, we're not talking about self-illuminating nocturnal eye shine. We're talking about its eyes got hit with the headlights, its eyes got hit with a flashlight, and now we see this red eye shine, okay? Um, the red wolf appearance, which, in, like I explained to you guys in the last video, this image is not a direct reflection. It's about 70% accurate of what that red wolf looks like. There's a lot more color added in there, uh, and in some cases, it's a hell of a lot less well-groomed. Um, the dominant, for whatever reason, I can't answer the question why, 
Um, the dominant eye shine on this one is that amber, reddish, amber, orange color. Um, it has the it has a 25% yellow and black eye sh eye color, and then 28% of that shining the red light, shining the light in the eyes at night, and it gives off that red illumination. Now, one of the things that I did notice when I was going through all my stuff and all my encounters was that these particular animals were seen a lot at night. So when we start talking about eye shine color and, and all the rest of that, I got to sprinkle a little grain of salt on that because these a lot of these were night encounters. They really, really were. And so we're going with the data from majority night encounters. And I believe that's why this 28% and that 47% might even blend and meld together to be like if I had to put them as one category, those first three eye shines would be one category because we're dealing with pretty much nocturnal activity with that particular creature. Um, let's go into the next one. This was interesting. Um, I, I kind of knew it from telling the stories, but the huge i mean huge freaking super muscular big bigfoot bodied dog wolf headed dog man its eye shine is 79 eye color is 79 percent that yellowish golden color the exact same thing that you saw in blue's photo it's that like a freaking golden flower but it's huge man it's crazy and another 21 percent are red and we're talking about red in the daytime, not red in the nighttime, red in broad daylight. At nighttime, you're going to end up getting that same um, reddish eye shine that, like I said, was consistent across the board. You'll notice I pretty much dropped that off and moved from here because it's consistent across the board that not self-illuminating, but that you shine the light and it gives that red reflection. I believe when we start talking about the genetically modified dog, man, I believe not only has their hearing their size and strength been modified, but I believe that their sight has been modified. One particular story in general, I mean, and, and one story in particular that I'll share with you that I haven't shared yet, this gentleman actually um, is in his RV camper, and he's camping in North Louisiana, and feels something shake the camper, like the, you know, the driving camper, like the big ones that you drive, where you have a generator on the back. He feels something shaking the back of the camper, and he thinks it's someone still in his generator, so he goes to the window, the back window where the actual bedroom is, opens the window and looks out. And he sees one of these huge, like super soldier, big ass dogmen. And when it looks up at him, it's eight feet away. Um, but the eyeballs are so big and the light's shining from behind him out through the window, he can see this thing. And the one thing that he said that scared the hell out of me, he was like, dude, I'm looking at these eyes, and he said, I noticed that the eye, iris, iris pupil, the pupil began to rotate. And I was like, what do you mean rotate? He said, the pupil rotated. I was like, you sure? He said, no, the pupil rotated. And I was like, well, how do you know? He said, because the pupil was misformed and misshaped. It wasn't a purple circle. It kind of had like ridges and spikes on the outside of it, and it rotated. And he said, scared the shit out of me. And I closed the window, go to crank the vehicle up and get the hell out of there. <clears throat> he says as he's pulling off to move, he realizes he's got too much stuff outside just to leave. So now he's debating, all right, well, do I go out to do I go out and get my what do I do? And he just never decides. He decides he never decides to leave. He decides to stay where he is and just click off the lights and hold it down, but sleep right up at the front to where if he needs to drive off, he can drive off. Well, I believe based on not only his encounter but another encounter that was similar to that that their eyesight has been radically altered. And it would make a lot of sense because some of the other stories that I've heard and some of the other things that people have shared with me, um, that's something that has not come out. I haven't disclosed in story format, but it probably will. The hyena dog, man, 85% of those have that amber and orange is yellow uh, color with another 12% with the golden, like these gold, not yellow, golden um, colored eyes. And then there's a 3% where it's like a brown on black, um, where it's literally like it's the, everything is brown, but then you see the black people. All right, going to the next one. 
Uh, when we start talking about the white and gray dog, man, which I told you guys are rare, which I told you guys, I believe these are creatures that have aged a lot and been around for a very long time. Um, or they've either adapted to their climate and their environment and their, they've, their fur truck color has changed for camouflage or things of that nature. We're talking about overwhelmingly 75% of these are having this yellowish um, eyeball with a black pupil or a golden eyeball with this black pupil. I use the yellow one here just to, for the point because the yellow one is the one that is described, but you can go with a golden, like an egg yolk yellow or a um, or a golden yellow eye, and then another 25% of that white eye with the with the black pupil. I believe that 25% is also an adaptation. I think these are your original dogmen. I think these are what originally came, what's been around forever, what's going to be around for a long time, and I think everything else is an offshoot of this. Um, the metallic dogman, which is the freaky, weird. I don't know, alien, I don't even know how to describe it. That son of a bitch is red eyeballs, I mean red eyes, black pupil, and it's self-illuminating. And this is something that a lot of people haven't gotten to. And it's self-illuminating red eyes shine at night, meaning you ain't got to shine no light in them eyes. You're going to see some glowing red eyes over there looking at you like, what the f is that? Self-illuminating. I want to be clear. Not manually illuminated like I'm shining a light in that direction. No, you're going to see some red eyes that like, what the f is this? You'd be riding around, riding your car, see some red eyes off in the trees. That's what I believe this thing is. And those, this is what the encounters line up, the data from the encounters line up to give me as well. All right, on to the next one. Final variation, final um, eye shine color. This is the demonic manifestations every time. Every time it's either been Red pupil, red eye self-illuminating, or black eyeball, red eye, body of the eye being red. And we're not talking about just the um, the pupil in the, pupil in the iris in this case. When we're talking about red eyes, we're talking about a complete red eye with a black dot in it. Like the whole eyeball is red with a black dot in it. And in this other case, it's a red, piercing red, self-illuminating pupil with everything else being a pinkish reddish color around it but you're not going to notice that well, most people don't really notice it because of the piercing red that's penetrating that they're looking at in the darkness of the bedroom or uh, in an alleyway but those are purely demonic I mean that's been the description of those there was one or two where it was like a black eye encounter but the one guy I kind of believed him but he up towards the end and then he wouldn't answer the phone for me to, to finish questioning him on where I thought he screwed up. The other guy, um, I don't know, something about something about him just, just didn't sit right with me. I didn't feel comfortable with his story made sense, but he didn't make sense. Like, there's people's stories who make sense, but the person doesn't make sense. It's kind of like me telling you, you know I'm overweight and I'm trying to get in shape. It's kind of like me telling you I ran a five-mile marathon and won. And then saw a dog, man. Like, you know that don't add up from the beginning. My big ass ain't running no marathon. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's kind of how his story was. It was all this other shit that just didn't make sense. But then his encounter made sense. And it left me in a bad situation where it's like, I know you lying about this. But now everything that you're saying in your encounter, encounter adds up 100%. But you lied to me about all this, period. I mean, there's no way you didn't lie to me. So what I devised from it was, you know, the guy was telling me an encounter that he heard from somebody else and he was trying to trying to interject himself into that encounter kind of as a storyteller taking someone else's story and making it his own but because the the tail end of the story was someone else's encounter it made sense but because he made up the front the first part none of that made sense and so it was kind of a, a blend of truth and fiction that he tried to get away with and it didn't work anyway um so when we start talking about eye shine and eye um, variations in eyes, this is the data that I have. Why is this important? It's important because at the end of the day, you hear the stories where I say, oh, it had this golden eye shine or it had this yellow eye with this black pupil or um, it was huge with this red eyeball 
and then a black pupil. And I want you to understand where I'm coming from. And I want you to go back and look. I mean, I'm not lying to you. This is all the data is that I use on all my stories. Go back and look, and you'll see that even in the stories as I describe this, I'm describing years ago, not just recently, years ago, this exact same data. Um, because I've been recording this data. I told you guys, I don't write down the person's story because I can memorize their story, especially if it's true. It just takes a little while for me to talk to them. But certain traits I do jot down. And that's how I ended up with these data points. Um, and it's in a notebook that's sitting right here. But it's one of those things to where if you want to get to the truth of something, there has to be a scientific approach. And when it comes to dog man, um, you have the Facebook approach where, you know, you collect encounters and people. It's kind of like you collect people in a Facebook group and manage those people. And then they all talk about dog man, right? And every now and then you get an encounter different Facebook. They funnel that person to whoever their favorite, you know, YouTuber is or talk show host, right? It's kind of like herding cattle. Um, then there's um, typically the conversations are the end result because of the or the interviews are the product because the interviews are monetized. And then you guys get an uh, end product, which is an interview, but you really don't get end result data from the products you just get a product which is sold to you via youtube and you watching advertisements whether you believe it or not you're paying for it one way or the other um or whether it's sold to you by podcast or membership or whatever what i'm giving you is the back-end data my back-end data that supports everything that i've been saying for years um i can only speak for myself i can only speak for my data I can only say there ain't nobody else out here doing this. The only person that probably ever got close to this is Linda um, and maybe one of the authors. I don't know them all. I'm not in that whole dog man, Bigfoot author group. They don't really feel me like that. And that's cool. I ain't mad at them. We ain't had an opportunity to talk, but nobody else is doing this. I think you should ask other people to do this. You should require some information from them for your own sake. So you can figure out where everything is and where things stand. It may take them a little time to put it together because now they got to go back and do work. And they can't just turn on the microphone and let somebody talk and then turn it off. Um, or turn on the microphone and talk about what somebody else told them and then turn it off. You understand what I'm saying? So, again, I said to you guys in the last video, the truth is there for you. It's been there. If you've been rocking with me, you've been getting the truth from the beginning. But the truth is out there across every channel, across every type of cryptid or demonic manifestation or appearance of anything the truth is there it's just how much work you're willing to put in to get to the truth and then for the kind of dog man demanders i call these people dog man demanders you know um demanders like i need to see this and i need to know this and i need to know that i'm giving you the game do what i'm doing and you're gonna have all the information you want outside of that sit your ass down and shut up and just enjoy the show you know what i'm saying all right, it's your boy, Dark Waters. That's the end of this video. I'm out. My next video, I'm going to go into some more um, particular things about the body. We're going to talk about legs. We're going to talk about arms. And we're going to talk about claws, claw lengths, um, and how they translate into footprints, uh, especially the hind prints. We're going to go into all that on the next one. All right, holla at you guys later. Peace. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy, Dog Waters, and I'm back again to give you guys another Dog Man data drop. I want to be clear with you guys why I'm doing this. I told you guys the last time I'm moving past this from a standpoint of, you know, people tend to worship this topic, um, and I I'm, will not be accused at the pearly gates of being fascinated with something that's clearly has demonic tendencies, clearly other stuff is going on with this, so... We're going to go into, um, I went to the map last time, which was great. You guys got an opportunity to see the map and see um, a lot of the data points I collected on the map. Now I'm going to go into my criteria for judging these encounters. Um, and then I'm going to go into some of the variations of the dogmen that, dog that I have been reported to me. Now, when we get to the variation part, these are the best photographic depictions of these things I could find or something that will be close. Um, they're not going to be accurate, um, but I, I explain all that as well. 
needless to say, let's get started. So, um, my data set is based on 650 encounters. Those encounters are graded from A to F, um, but the F encounters are not included in the 650 encounters. If I was to add the Fs, I've had about 400 Fs where it was just, um, you shoot me an email, and we'll get to that. And I'll explain what an F is. It doesn't mean, when I get to F, it doesn't mean that you're not telling me the truth. It just means that I, I don't even entertain those because to a certain extent, you need to go out of your way to get in contact with me if you want to share something with me. So I don't I don't really entertain emailed or text message stories. I mean, anybody who's been around a long time, you guys know I don't entertain that. Um, I tell you, if you want to talk to me, you can email me and we'll set up a time to talk or you call me on the phone number. But outside of that, You've never heard me like give you some kind of email dog man encounter. I don't do that. All right. So grade A encounters. Um, these are encounters where witnesses are active duty, law enforcement, military, emergency services with two or more witnesses of the encounter, meaning two or more people had to see the encounter. Um, the only exception that makes it an A plus without all the other criteria is the person is a close, close personal associate of mine. Um, for more than five years that I'm going to go ahead and consider their word. I take them at their word and I, I grade that as an A+. Plus. Um, also, under A+, plus are witnesses with real-time evidence um, and that go through subsequent interviews and questioning. So, Blue is an A-plus encounter because not only did he have the evidence, but we, we threw in detail his, uh, his encounter via the interview. And with the interview that you guys heard, there was an additional four hours of conversation before we even got to that interview so that was thoroughly vetted um quick sidebar note one of the reasons why i'm disclosing this because i want to put an end to the about oh whose stories or fake whose stories are this there's nobody else out here who has criteria as to how they vet their stories this criteria i've been discussing for a very long time um but we're going to put an end to all the rest of the foolishness uh that where people say oh your stories are made up and Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're putting an end to it. And you, you'll understand that relatively soon because I'm giving examples of it. All right, A minus encounter. This is an encounter, encounter where the witness is retired law enforcement, military emergency services, emergency services with two or more witnesses of the encounter. Um, when we start talking about law enforcement and military emergency services, um, nurses, doctors, um, Navy SEALs, um, Air Force people, people like that who typically just, they don't have it in them. They have a certain level of integrity that reaches beyond the average civilian integrity. And every time I've ever spoken to one of those people, they're on a level where it's, hey, I, I don't really have anybody to talk to about this. I just want to share my story. I don't have a problem if you reshare it, but I want to know what's going on. I want to know what this is. Or it's, you know, I've had this encounter. I can't talk to to anybody about it. I want to get the information out there, but I can't get it out there myself, right? So those are my A plus and A minus encounters. My B encounters are civilians with um, encounters with civilians four or more hours of vetting and interviewing, and then independent communication with family members and friends in an attempt to verify a change in a witness's behavior upon having the encounter. And what I mean by that is this: if you call me and you say, two of you guys call and say, oh, man, we saw, me and my boy saw Dog Man. That's your phone call. Okay, cool. Tell me your story. And I go through and I say, listen, um, that's awesome. I mean, that was a scary encounter. Your homeboy was with you. Let's say his name is Bob. Is there any kind of way I can talk to Bob? Yeah, you can talk to Bob. So now I'm talking to Bob. And Bob verifies that story. Now, just to make sure that people are not lying to me. And because people can coordinate and um, and come up with a story, what I then do is is I turn around and I try either I ask to speak to their wife, their husband, or one of their children, or I continue conversations with them. This is where the four hour plus thing comes in. Uh, I continue to have conversations with them and call them at hours where they should be home with their family, and try and capture and catch little nuances in the background from their husband or wife that's if they don't allow me to talk to their husband or wife or if they say oh you know i really don't want to discuss this with my wife um you know i don't want her knowing i don't want her to be afraid so now I, that has my ears perked up and that's the first sign that it definitely is not going to ever be an a encounter but 
Um, there's my ears perked up, and now I'm trying to listen for him or her in the situation where they're with their significant other, and now I can hear the significant other's opinion. So normally when I talk to a witness and they're talking uh, and they're sharing their encounter, if their significant other is in the background, and it's a real encounter, their significant other is chiming in into the conversation. They'll say something like, yeah, that had you real depressed and I didn't know what to do. This was crazy, blah, 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 blah. And that way you're getting validation from the significant other and that leads, lends a hell of a lot of credibility to what's going on. The most important thing for me is behavioral changes um, of the witness after having that encounter. And so it's, I weigh heavily on that. Remember, um, I'm not there with the person for the most part. I'm talking to them over the phone. So I have to take these clues, um, during these conversations. I absolutely have to dig in and find these type of things that would allow me to get to the truth. Um, also encounters with two or more witnesses that are subject to the same, uh, vetting, which is what I'm saying. There's two or more witnesses, um, four more hours of uh, conversation. And we're not talking about, I'm talking about conversation with each witness. So if it's two people that say they saw it, the first person, I'm talking to him for four hours. The second person, I'm talking to him for a minimum of four hours. And I'm listening for those cues in both family households. All right. Um, the next grade of encounters, and you guys have to forgive me because I am doing this live, and uh, all right, the next grade of encounters, which are, here we go, B minus encounters, um, why is it not showing me B minus, here we go. Uh, B minus encounters are encounters with civilian witnesses less than four hours of vetting or interviewing with two or more witnesses without family verification, but including cross cross witness communication and ver verification. So you are at a B minus if I can't garner or gather anything from your husband or your wife. Um, but I am still able to vet the story between the two witnesses. That takes a significant less, I mean, it takes significantly less amount of time to do that because I have the two people that I'm talking to. Oftentimes I get them on the phone on three way and I can communicate with both of those people at the same time. But it, without that additional verification of the family member, it downgrades to a B minus. All right. C encounters are encounters with civilians less than two hours of vetting or interviewing a single witness behavior changes observed by family members and verified, meaning. I'm going to spend less than two hours in vetting this person. Um, it's a single witness, so I have nobody to cross-examine. But I'm getting the behavioral change data from the family member. Again, it's very important the language that I'm using, behavioral change data, meaning that there has been a documented behavioral change. You decided to do something different. For example, man, I saw this thing in the woods, and I just don't go in the woods anymore. It scared the hell out of me. Um... And the family member's like, yeah, he, he used to love being in the woods. He just doesn't go in the woods anymore, right? So um, when you're vetting people in this manner and you're trying to get to the truth, you, you have to take what's given to you, all right? C minus encounters. Encounters with civilian witnesses, less than one hour of vetting, interviewing, signal witness, change uh, behavior changes observed, observed by the family members verified. Um, same thing as the one above. It's just that, that person is talking to me less than one hour, which means they're, in this case, it's people who are, they're hesitant to talk, they're talking a little bit, but I'm having to pull too much stuff out of them. Although I got an observation from the family member in the background, but I still can't get them to just give me everything I need. The less than one hour is because they're not giving it to me. It's not that I'm not willing to dedicate three, four hours to the conversation, it's just that they're not forthcoming with the information, all right? Uh, the D encounters, encounters with civilians, less than one hour of vetting or interviewing a single witness, displays clear signs of schizophrenia, delusion, paranoid behavior, or narcissism, mentions of dog man encounter radio as reference to background or encounter. I get a lot of these um, encounters, um, and to be clear, this, and, and just to make sure I didn't mispronounce this and say this wrong, the 650 is A through C, D and F are left out of the 650. I'm not sure if I misspoke and said that earlier. Um, now, the significant thing about the D encounters and it's that 
you know immediately, at least I know immediately when it's a DM counter. Because the person is way too excited to talk to me. Um, either they sound frantic and mantic on the phone, um, or they use the word I a hell of a lot. Like I, 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 I. I mean, it's insane, right? Anytime anybody mentions, you know, I was on Dog Man Encounters Radio or I heard about this on Dog Man, I, you drop in the D group immediately. I'm sorry. It's just, it is what it is. Because I know now that you're going over and you're taking data points and reference points from a show that's been around for a long time. And um, and then you're turning around and it's, your data is going to be polluted, period. I mean, it's polluted. Not saying everybody over there t- that's telling their stories are liars. It's just that I know that if you have that fascination with that and you haven't vetted out and listened to what's being said over there and you consider that to be true, then I already know that you got a freaking issue. You know what I'm saying? Because it's clear that there's some crazy going on over there. All right. F encounters. All things that submitted to me by email, in my opinion, are F encounters. Not because they're the person's lying or they're not telling the truth, but it's just you haven't put the effort into expressing or sharing your encounter. My phone number is public. Um, my email is public. Um, you, If you just feel like, okay, I'm going to submit this to you in writing, then, I mean, you're really not dedicating to get your point across. And the story really didn't affect you the way you thought it was or the way it should have in order for you to go out of your way to communicate. So if you submit something by email and it's, or, you know, that's considered an F in my book immediately. All right. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, we're going to go into the variations that I've documented. Um, all right, as we go into the variations I documented, let me backtrack just a little bit and address something. Um, when I did the map, I'm not sure if it's trolls or if it's people who absolutely just have a good question. It is a good question. I'm counting on it to be trolls because I wanted them to find themselves trying to expose me. But one of the questions that came across was, well, if you're paying a financial incentive, how do you assure that the person is not lying to you and just trying to get the money? The grade levels that I use in the verification process guarantees that that person is not lying to me. It's not like I'm saying, hey, I'm going to pay you this money up front before you tell me, before I tell you my story. My thing is this, tell me the story, share the information with me, Allow me to have a minimum, a minimum of four hours of conversation with you. Um, and if you can't, if they don't agree four hours, I say, man, I got to get at least two hours of conversation with you and, and then get an opportunity to go through this encounter um, and get everything. And then now I'm on the hook for 75, 50, 100 bucks. At the end of the day, I'm willing to lose 50 bucks, 75 bucks in order to get a great encounter. But As I'm paying, as I'm on the hook for this money, I'm listening and verifying, listening and verifying, listening and verifying, and going through this process to make sure that I'm getting what I need to get. Now, here's the thing. There's been money that I paid out on stuff that was just a flat-out lie, but you never heard it. I didn't produce it, but it was a flat-out lie, and I negotiated the price down. I'm like, yo, you gave me a story, bro. Um, There's some things that are missing. There's some things that are off. You know, I could do 25 bucks and they're like, okay, well, I'll take 25 bucks. Now, here's the crazy thing. And this is what people don't understand. 90% of the people who have a true story, they turn the money down. They say, I don't don't worry about it. I don't want, I don't want any money, man. You can use it. So a lot of people actually turn the money down. And that's stuff that's on the back end that you, you literally wouldn't know about unless I told you. For example, the interview I just put out on the website. I talked to that guy over the past two and a half years. Like, literally, past two and a half years. It's an hour and a half long interview. Hey, bro, you know, I pay $75 an hour for you to do the interview. Off that, dog waters. I don't want no money. I make money. I want you to agree to honor my father by telling my story and producing my story, bro. Like, can we agree to that? Yeah, okay, I got you, dog. You see what I'm saying? So, um, for the people who are out there who say, well, look, DW, you know, you're paying people, that, and that means you're attracting people who are going to lie to you. That's if you are under the impression or you listen to other podcasts where the interviewer just lets the person sit there and talk and doesn't ask any questions, doesn't chunk down on anything. 
Well, they just like, oh, let me turn the microphone off and walk away and let you talk into the microphone. That's not what I do. My criteria shows you exactly what I do to get to the true encounters. And my criteria also shows you why the encounter sounds different than anything you've ever heard. And you can actually tell the encounters where it's been like A plus A encounters because you hear the difference between the two. You hear the more the details in the A's and the A minuses that you don't hear in the C minus in the C. And it's all consistent. So just to answer that question of people who gonna, you know, who's gonna say that, that's your answer. And of, and of course, to the Dark Waters family, you guys know I've been held to a different standard since we came through the door. You know what I'm saying? So I've automatically held myself to a different standard. And then there was all this that went on where people tried to um, to destroy my reputation. So I've had to hold myself to a higher standard. And my standard has proven over time to, to produce phenomenal, amazing content across the board. And the standard is the same. Whether it's like Dog Man, Bigfoot, Ghost, Demon. The standard doesn't shift. I need these verifications in order for me to be content confident to produce the content. Now, if I've been talking to you for two years, and we've been going back and forth for two years, you might slip by me because you just was a sociopath. And you was like, I'm just going to lie to this for two years straight. You might get me. If you're willing to, if you're willing to lie to a human being for two years straight or for a year straight, then guess what? You got me. I could deal with that. You a lying son of a... You know what I'm saying? I like, you got a problem. But outside of that, my criteria... It's like Mike Tyson said, my defense is impregnable. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's impregnable. So, it's one of those things to where if you're coming over and looking at my content and looking at what I'm saying, hold, compare my standards to the standards of the people that you listen to out there. And you will see that they're nowhere close. Nobody's going to communicate this to you because they don't have any standards. Because it's all about content creation. It's why, back in the gap, and anybody who's been around for a while... You know, there was time periods where I was like, this, I don't want to do it. Then there was time periods where I was producing content. And it was just nothing coming out. But I was behind the scenes holding hundreds of conversations, literally hundreds of conversations. And then I'll come to the forefront and I'll, when it came to dog, man, I'll come to the forefront, I'll dump a little bit. And then I'll go back and I'll start doing other stuff. Then I'll come forward and I'll dump a little bit. Um, and that's because you have to go, at least I have to go through these verification processes in order to make sure it works. All right, let's go on to the next thing. Um, that's enough of dealing with trolls and retards. All right. So variations in dog man appearances, and this is set up in a percentage of the 650 encounters. And I'm going to share some very significant things with you guys about this. Um, all right. So when we start talking about variations in looks of these creatures, there's been a lot said. I mean, there's actually been, if not mistaken, Vic Cundiff came out with like a variant chart years ago, um, which was, I mean, if you do a variant chart, you do a variant chart. I said then that it was a part of monetization, and I still believe that that was a part of the monetization of it. Um, but nonetheless, it still proved a, a pretty good point. Um, there are variations, but some nobody's ever quantified the number of sightings versus the variation of the dog man um, and quantified it where anybody can see it. So I'm going to share with you my data. And this is my data based on 650 encounters, which lets you guys know how much more dog man content I really have. Um, based on 650 encounters, A, again, because I think I misspoke earlier and I don't care to go edit it, A through C minus, all right? You saw the criteria of A, you saw the criteria of C minus, you know what D is, you know what F is, right? So when we start talking about the black wolf appearance dog man, this image of the dog man was the closest thing that I can get to that anybody has described to me. Um, and that's and what's significant about this is if you look at this photo, you see the top short pointy ears. You see what looks like a mange on the back of his neck, but it's actually a hump on the back of his neck. In the interview I just did, the gentleman had described it as he said, man, it was a wolf, but it seemed like it had like a fur coat on its shoulders, right? Well, I didn't I didn't tell him this in this interview, but it really what he was looking at was the hump on the back of its back where the fur was growing. 
All right. And so when we talk about the black wolf appearance dog, man, there are two. There's a very muscular one and there's a slender one. Out of all the encounters, 37% of the encounters have been that black wolf with the muscular appearance. The same thing that you saw in Blue's photo with the golden eye, right? Out of 7% have been this slender, um, not emaciated, but it more looked like the freaking werewolf guy on um, uh, Harry Potter. It, it was that slender, really, really slender, long-armed look. Um, but I can confidently tell you that that depiction that that artist did was 92% accurate for that particular dog, man. Then the next appearance, which people don't really talk about, is the red fox or red wolf appearance. Um, and these are slender, non-muscular. It's not like it's bulky and big, but it's slender, and non-muscular. But it looks like a red, really I should, that word should be fox. But it looks more like a fox than um, than a wolf. And I, that's about 70% accurate. What I would say different is the is the coloration and the snout. There's more white mixed in with that brown Um and there's a little bit less fur than what's depicted in this photo. But this is the closest thing I can get to it. So I ran with it. Um, the next variation, and you guys got to forgive me because I'm moving these in as I go. And I'm kind of recording this as I go. We're going to get into some significant things. All right, next variation is the um, is the super soldier or genetically modified dog, man. I call him genetically modified dog, man. The closest thing I can get to this was... A photo that I found online from a video game, but I can I can pretty much explain to you guys from this photo what it looks like. So forget the whole human ab and pectoral muscle and bicep, um, because it's it's not that look, but it is an overly it's a barrel chest. Um, puffed out rib, large head like that, fur that goes down its back, but combined with that ridge or that lump on the back of its head, like it's this huge ridge. Now, it stands on two legs a lot like a Bigfoot and not more so like a dog man. So it's not the hock legs, it's standing like a freaking Bigfoot. But it's clearly a gigantic dog head. The only thing I've seen that came close to this, and I'm not sure if it's true, and I, I refuse to use their photo because I don't have their proof, but one of these dogman sighting groups had a photo of um, a gigantic head freaking creature. Um, I can't remember. It was one of the research groups. I saw it years ago, and that was the closest thing to the description um, which witnesses have shared with me. And these things are very, very aggressive, extremely aggressive. Um... I would say sociopathic is the way to describe them. Now, that's been 11% of my encounters altogether, um, the genetically modified ones. And we're going to get into eye shine and all of that in the next video. We're just going through this because I'm percentage-wise, I'm going to break down everything because there's a lot of stuff that people just don't disclose and they haven't quantified it in a manner in which it can be easily digested. The next one is the hyena-faced dog man. Now, um, this picture is 50% accurate, I would say, and, and here's why. That stupid bat ear on this photo is not what it is. The snout is very accurate. The, the hair, ridge hair up the top of the nose all the way up is very accurate. The spotting is inaccurate from the sense that it's covered in a lot more fur. And nobody's told me that they actually saw the spots. The every, every reference to the hyena was the hyena looking face. Um, so it's going to be more hair than what's depicted here. Uh, the, there's a great artist depiction. Um, and the snout is a little bit longer than that. Now, these dog men are very, very aggressive as well. Why? I have no clue. I mean, honestly, I have no clue why they're aggressive, but they're definitely very, very, very aggressive. Um, but that bat-looking ear is just that wrong. It's a sharp, pointy ear that's often laid back as opposed to shooting straight up. And that's the depiction. That's the best way I could describe it from what my witnesses have shared with me. All right. Let's go into the next one. And now we're getting ready to get in this. That really nobody discusses um, at all. Oh, that didn't work right. Let's do this. Um, come on, baby. Show me the whole thing. You keep on deleting it. Why would you do that, baby? 
It's my side chick acting stupid. All right, here we go. Next one. Uh, I need to move this here. All right, the next one is the gray, and I call them gray slash white, off-white dog men. Um, and these are the ones where people say they look like the wolf from Underworld. Um, these creatures are extremely, extremely smart. I've come to the conclusion that the gray hair is, is from aging. And the behavioral patterns of these creatures, well, I come to two conclusions. One is that it's from aging. And that, but the behavioral patterns of them are um, way more intelligent. They tend to be stalkers. They tend to be looking at people from trees. They tend to be extremely clever in how they behave. It's almost as if they are the Michael Jordans of Dogman. You know what I'm saying? They they literally are the ones that have a keen understanding of human nature, which makes them extremely dangerous to me because. Um, there are stories that are coming in the future where I'll share with you where um, they've had the ability to surround a group of campers um, and not only surround them, but start herding them into other dogmen. But it was the gray one who seemed to coordinate that entire attack. Uh, even if you go back to Caesar Lock and Ranch story, it was everything was the freaking gray one that was dictating everything that happened and everything that went down. It was that older looking dog man gray dog man that dictated everything with all the rest of them the next one is the metallic looking dog man now this is something that i've had a lot of encounters about but i've never really gone into it a lot um and it's literally i'm not sure what it is but it's described to me as a freaking werewolf but it looks metallic it the problem is there's no sound there's no metallic sound associated with it. Because imagine if you're thinking something's moving and it's made of metal, you hear it clacking and clinking and clacking and clinking. There's no metallic sound associated with it. And it's clear that it's not any armor on this creature. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's an armored dog, man. It just has this metallic look to it, this metallic skin to it. And it's not hairy at all, which is the craziest thing. It's literally no hair. It just looks like it's made of metal. Um... I've had some very good A and A minus and B encounters about this. I haven't gone into them yet. I'm holding on to those for later. Um, but as we go through this, you're going to hear that as well. And that's at 5%. All right. The last one is the demonic encounters. And I describe these encounters as breathtaking for one simple fact. You're in your house or you're in your apartment, and they happen in environments that are completely alien to dog man. What I mean by alien is you would expect to find something that looks like a, a werewolf in the woods by a river, maybe in the woods around a corner from your house if you got if you back up to like a wood line or something like that. But you don't expect to find this type of activity in the middle of the city. You don't expect to find this activity in an alleyway in downtown Atlanta. Now, here's a significant thing that I have not disclosed, and I will disclose this. There's been a lot of talk about, like, werewolves and um, things of that nature, men who transform into wolves. The significant things about um, a lot of these encounters is when I talk to people, and these are Bs, B-minuses encounters, husband and wives, um, where I can talk to both of them. They're in the bed or they're out on a date. In some cases, they see what looks like the black wolf. But in other cases, they see something that looks more sinister, looks more human, but wolf, like a human-wolf hybrid inside their bedroom. Um, not a man that physically came into their house and unlocked the door and took off his clothes and went, Rawr! it's like a demonic human-wolf hybrid is what they're seeing. Um and my ideas on what this is, is either it's somebody who's dabbled in black magic. Um, they've been worshiping it and like by listening to too much content and the actual that worship leads to them creating either, you know, pulling in some demonic entity or actually manifesting a topa, which people will do that. Or you just have the worst luck on the world in the world for you to encounter something like this. But to me, this manifestation is the most frightening because 
the concept of me being like in my in my crib right now, getting up in the middle of the night to go take a piss in something that looks like that. And that was the closest thing I can get to it because it's clearly part human, clearly part animal, but it's clearly demonic. Um, in my house, it's absolutely frightening because the doors are locked, the windows are locked. It makes no sense for something like that to be here. But it, people are seeing it. And that's um, that's a deal breaker for me, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, I haven't had that, but I've talked to a significant amount of people who have had that type of encounter. I'll be going into some more of those real soon as well. So... I wanted to put out publicly my criteria. I wanted to put out publicly my variations and my percentages. We're going to go into the next video I'm going to go into are the eye shine, the variations in eye shine, the percentages of them, which dog man they're associated with the most. Um, and then uh, I'm losing my track of thought. I'll tell you about what comes after that when I get to it. But we're going to go into I told you we was doing a dog man data drop and we we're really going to do a drop of my information so um again i appreciate you guys for listening i appreciate you guys taking time to um to listen to the video oh also if you want the latest dog man encounter um it's on the website you need to become a member if you're a member you haven't been over there it's called my dad killed dog man uh that's up right now it's a good encounter good interview um, that will be created into a story per agreement and put out on YouTube. Um, I, I'm going to try and do it by Sunday. I might not be able to do it by Sunday, no later than Monday. Um, it's a really, really good encounter that goes into, um, it goes into the level of understanding that previous generations had of the things that go bump at the night, um, and how to deal with them. And it, a lot can be gleaned from that encounter as far as it concerns with like um wildlife department and fishing game um because they actually came out and set traps to try and trap these things um it, it's a good interview so if you're not a member sign up go listen to it if you are a member get off youtube and go over there and listen to the stuff that you're paying for because it's good stuff now really quick i saw a couple of members saying hey man the people on youtube get more stuff than i am no they're not you are getting the dopish that's out that i have right now it's just that you, the dope takes a little bit of time. So I need you to chill. Just like it was two days before you got anything, then you got an hour-long interview. That was dope as hell, right? Prior to that, you got the emergency broadcast where we went into stuff that you and your family need. I'm feeding you the best that I have as a member. I mean, the best that I have. Like, there's, like, you're getting A's and A-minuses and B's. You're getting that smoke across the board. You know what I'm saying? The best. So, relax your nerves, chill. If you don't get nothing in a day, just know when you get something, it's going to be epic. It ain't going to be no BS. You know what I'm saying? Because that's how I rock. That's how it's always been. Anybody who's been around me and been following me, you know, if I get quiet for a day or two, some dope coming. You know what I'm saying? It's not, I'm not working. I'm just bringing you some dope. All right, love you guys. I appreciate you. Holla at your boy. Microphone checker, mic microphone checker, one, two. Looks like we are working. This thing said I've been live for eight minutes, baby. That's crazy. So y'all been listening to me sit here and sing Secret Garden by Quincy Jones for the last eight minutes. Damn, I didn't mean to do that, but it is what it is. That's what took me so long. I got distracted and I was listening to Quincy Jones and and uh, Barry White, Al B. Shore, and James Ingram. All right, so... Ladies and gentlemen, I am pretty confident that you can hear me. <clears throat> and we're going to do a quick deep dive into some more of my dog man data points. Gentlemen in the chat, hello, how are you? I hope life is treating you well. I'm pretty sure I have a mad echo right now. I mean, it's probably insane. There is literally nothing I can do about it. I can try and talk into this freaking microphone muffler thing, but that's just disgusting. So. Uh, you're going to have to deal with it. You dig? But like, you, as you know, there's literally no carpet in here. Okay, of course, this phone call comes while I'm online. I don't know who the hell you are, but bye. Um, and so, you're going to get a little bit of an echo. Can't do nothing about it. It's just the sound is screwed up. Or I can go into the bedroom and lay across that bed. But I've been listening to that secret garden, Sunshine. 
I know you know about that Quincy Jones. In the garden, where temptation is so right. All right, let's go into this dog, man. Let me quit playing. I'm in a great mood. Oh, it's not like being from a city where it goes wrong all the time. And so when it goes side, sideways, you just like, whatever. All right, this is the tab I'm sharing. So dog, man, deep dive. Behavior observations based on terrain. Um, I did this in August. Didn't get a chance to put it out, but we're going to go over it. So we're going to talk about some things. Now, come on, Mike Mouse. What are you doing, Mies Mouse? All right, so these just information is extracted from the same data points that you guys um, saw with the variations in size and eye color and things of that nature. Um, so, some Marvin C. Speaking through the one, I love me some Marvin C's. Dog, don't get me started because, like, I will DJ on this freaking live stream and destroy it. You know what I'm saying for real? Because I love uh, me some Marvin C's. People don't understand Marvin C's saying that I'll be your candy liquor girl. I just want to be eight days a week, your candy liquor, girl. The man say eight days a week, your candy liquor. But let me stop. We're not going to go there because, you know, we get the agony of fool around him. All right. So let me get focused. All right. Like I was saying, this is all extrapolated from the data points that you guys have seen in the past based on eye variations and eye color and size. Uh, I got one that I already done that talks about speed. Now, the speed is a little bit harder to quantify but i try my best nonetheless but what this is talking about is the scenario that you may find yourself in in um based on terrain three types of terrain dense wooded forest um the second type of terrain is um swamp lands and wetlands the third type of terrain is rural farmland primarily now, when you get to urban, which is, you know, apartment complexes, cities, roads, streets, you literally don't have dogman encounters in that area. You may have them on the outskirts of suburban areas, urban, suburban areas, going to where you kind of borderline being in a suburbs slash light rural area, rural area. But I compensate for that and account for that. Okay. So, um, you guys will have the opportunity to, you have an understanding once I get through this. Um, someone's talking about Onk. Yeah, Onk is, the rest of Onk is coming, man. I, I don't want to record Onk in this environment, the other parts to it. The next part of Onk is like four hours long, dude. And if you listen to that story, then you kind of, if you listen to that story and been following me on Facebook and you've been following me um, on my Twitter accounts, then you are really getting to know me as a person. Um, from listening to that story and the next set of stories is going to explain a lot of what you've seen on Facebook that you didn't understand which is my way of communicating with a lot of people that is not particularly you uh, but anyway let me stop being distracted and go into this so those are the scenarios and these are what I was saying this is what I was able to extrapolate from those scenarios so we talk about scenario one now in scenario one this is um the linchpin for scenario one is these are unintentional encounters. Whoa, what happened there? All right, here we go. Let's go. The conditions. This is non, um, non-initiated contact, <clears throat> unintentional encounters, no previous contact with a dog, man. You are not shooting at it. You're not showing it any kind of aggressive behavior. And for the sake of this presentation, the individual, the witness is being labeled as the targeted individual, right? In this environment, which is the dense wood forest, you know, national park type of area, these are the common behaviors that people experience. Um, stalking. And my definition of stalking is very specific. And you will understand it if you've ever been had an encounter. It is, as you move through the woods, it moves. The minute you stop moving, it stops moving. It's not... That is my definition of stalking and you know, extrapolated from the data sets. You know, there's other ways to define stalking, but this, for the terminology of this, um, this is what we're talking about. Then flanking, which is done in a couple of ways. Um, one way is circling around the target, um, 
and like pacing you step for step. <clears throat> and then at some point in time, the witnesses hear something moving in the woods away from them. But if you find yourself in a national forest and you find something pacing you step for step, and then you hear it moving away, do not assume that it's leaving. It's actually flanking you and it's circling out and around to get ahead of you. And then what it will do is it will start pacing you and stalking you step to step, maybe 50, 100 yards ahead on the path that you're moving. So be mindful of that. And then the other behavior that we that I found when you're dealing with, you know, witnesses who are not being aggressive, witnesses who do not did not go out there seeking dog, man, they're not doing anything. They just you just in the wrong place at the wrong time is the herding. And what I, what I terminology, the term that I, the definition of herding that I'm using is the use of intimidation to guide a target to a desired, desired area. Meaning um, you're in an area, it starts to make noise, it starts to move in on you, but it's trying to drive you in a certain direction. Uh, and typically, if you have not been aggressive toward these, towards these creatures whatsoever, that hurting is hurting you away from their territory. It's not hurting you deeper into their territory. Now, you'll see there's a, a, a huge difference once you start you know, bringing weapons into the equation and aggressive human behavior into the equation. Things go a whole nother route. Sorry, I had to clear my voice. Um, Uh, let's check these comments because there's like some interesting stuff going on over here real quick. Let's see. And let's go. All right, let's go to the next part of the presentation. That's just a conversation about um, the blue eyes. What's up, Sean? Good to see you here. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, that's not the one. All right. Wetlands and swamps. This is, and the guys, you know, the majority of my encounters come from the south, um, from what you would consider the southeastern portion of the United States, coming from Texas all the way over through Florida, all the way up um, in the Alabama, Kentucky, um, Tennessee, and some of those areas. For whatever reason, I just haven't caught on in on the West Coast like I have in the South, but that's fine. It's no big deal. All right. So scenario two, wetlands and swamps. Again, the conditions are the same. This is a person who's there. They're not looking for dog man, no previous contact, no shooting, no aggressive behavior on their part. <clears throat> the tact is kind of, they're, they're not kind of different. They are different in the swamps and, it, it, and it's a significant difference. So stalking in the wetlands and the swamps is not only done on land, but it's done from tree to tree. Um, and there's a significant difference between the stalking on land and as they're moving in trees, because the tree movement is very intrusive and very obvious to you as the target, meaning you know something's there in the tree. Um, the problem that you run into if you find yourself as that person who's having that unintentional encounter and you hear it in the trees, it's not necessarily a warning sign because they do other things to warn you. Um, it's really an attack, a sign of an attack or an ambush. So you want to be mindful of that. I'm walking around in the swamps, you know, freaking going down to do, go catfishing or crabbing or <clears throat> gator hunting. And something big is in a tree. That is not a sign of, I want you out of my territory. That's a sign of, I'm about to eat you. And I want you to be mindful of that. Um, period. There have been a number of accounts that I've talked to people out of Florida. Some of them people don't want me to share where they have come down out the trees after them. And that's how I know this is pure ambush, pure I'm about to eat your ass attack, all right? <clears throat> the other frightening thing about the swamps is something that people don't really talk about a lot. The flanking in the swamps is a lot, a lot different. And sometimes it involves submersion. And what I mean by submersion is this. And I'll just read it. Define as circling a target from tree to tree, then submerging in the water and wading, also swimming underwater to a target on a bank or in a boat. <clears throat> the submerging tactic, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're using, 
it's all this dust in here, man, because it's freaking shut up, James. Just keep moving. Don't worry about it. You're gonna fix that. Um, the submerging tactic of submerging themselves in water and actually jumping out of the water or climbing out of the water is um is one of the most frightening type of encounters that I've heard. There was one recently, this was a month and a half ago, a guy called me. No, that was two months ago. A guy called me from Booty, Louisiana. And in Booty, he's out catfishing, like noodle catfishing, where they take these um, PVC pipes and these like styrofoam noodles and they toss them in the water. And, you know, you can do like 25 of them per person. And, you know, it floats on the water. And then when you catch a catfish, the freaking catfish drags this floating gigantic noodle around. You ride up in your boat, pick it up and put it, put the catfish in the boat, right? <clears throat> he encountered a dog man that literally swam up to his boat underwater and then rose his head out of the water. And it rose his head out of the water on the back end of the boat by the engine. He was on the front end. And the only reason why this gentleman knew that this thing was there was because he had an eerie ass feeling. His exact words was like, James, like I've been out there all day. It didn't seem like nothing was wrong. He said, I'm over there bending over to pick up a catfish, and I just got a bad feeling. And he said, I'm looking at the back of the boat, and when I look at the back of the boat, I see these gigantic ears coming up out of the water. Then I see the eyes, and he's like, man, I'm I'm freaked out. I said, well, how did you get away? He had already been using a trolling motor at the front to get from spot to spot to pick up his noodles. So he just hit the trolling motor as fast as he can go and then pulled away from it. So... Um, that's one of the more frightening things. You don't really hear much about that in interviews and stories. Herding, also. Um, in this case, you experience herding in the swamps, and it's typically out of the territory unless you're just in an area where you ran into a bunch of hungry dogmen and they herd you into an ambush. But normally, you're being moved out of the area. Like even the guy who I just told you the story about, like if it wanted to flip over his boat, it could have flipped over his boat. I think it wanted him out of that freaking area. And so it got what it wanted and he got the hell out of there. All right, let me go back and check. Makita, hello, beautiful. How are you doing? Thank you for joining us, Sunshine. My lady's always there. She's cool. Good afternoon. Um, nothing, no questions. Okay, so you guys can hear me fine. Everything is all good. No issues, right? Somebody said they're leaving after this show to go fishing. That's cool, Dale. All right, next one. And I'm not sure how big this is. On my school, let's do this. Maybe that'll make it bigger. Let's try this. All right, this might work out a little bit better. All right, scenario three in terrain and scenario number three is rural, residential, and just typical rural area, areas. Um, there's a couple of things that you need to be concerned about if you if you butt up to a national forest, um, if you butt up, your property butts up to a river or a creek or a stream, and especially crop location and farming land. Um, is And this is where these encounters come from, but these are kind of the terrain conditions. And we're still with the normal conditions of you're not doing anything. You're not looking for dog, man. You're not trying to hang out with dog, man. None of that. But their tactics and behaviors change. Uh, and the number one thing that changes is the revealing when you come to residential areas where um, like this, they actually reveal themselves, showing themselves to the target, targeted individual. And I've come to the conclusion that um, revealing is both an aggressive and a curious behavior. And what I mean by that is this. I show I'm nine foot tall freaking werewolf, basically, right? With the ability to hide and, and disguise myself. But I show myself to you, number one, as a form of intimidation, but also as a, uh, a, a, a form because I'm curious to see how you react to my presence. And you know this to be true. Now, I know this to be true because in so many encounters, they reveal themselves. And then based on how that person behaves, it dictates their future behavior, right? So, for example, 
you, you know, you, everybody's heard about someone who shot Dog Man because they saw it. It actually allowed them to see it. They shot it. It came back and acted a damn fool. There's also been people who saw Dog Man and just put their head down and bowed down and backed away and went on about their business and never had a problem with them. There have been people who've seen Dog Man and threw something at it, and then the next day it threw something at them. So um, I believe that from this creature's perspective, not from the human perspective, but from its perspective, it's not only a form of intimidation, but it's kind of a curious um, intelligence gathering behavior on their part to see how you're going to react to their presence. And then they dictate their behavior on that. Um, once you start getting into rural areas with houses, now that's when you're peeping through windows and doors starts. Again, I believe that's more curious, true curious behavior like, okay, let me see what's going on in this house. And then the stalking around the house is significantly different from um, the stalking in the woods or in the swamps. Stalking around the house is typically done from trees, um, like in the tree watching. you. And if you go back and, and listen to a number of my encounters, you'll find that it's a significant amount of times that these things are in actual trees and they're watching the house from the tree. All right, moving on to the next one. Now, scenario four, five, and six is when we start to introduce weapons and aggressive behavior from the human in the equation, which I call the targeted person. Um, once we start to introduce aggressive behavior into these encounters, things change significantly. I mean, they really, really do change significantly. So scenario four, we go back to the dense woods and forests, national parks, things of that area, um, which is, well, essentially what I'm saying is areas that are not populated, like you out there, there may be another human being in a, a 80 mile radius. There may only be one other person, right? Or, you know, you're just out there on your own. The conditions change, but you're not. And what I mean by conditional changes, I mean, simply you're not intentionally looking for dog man, but you are, you have a weapon, you provoke the shooting or you're provoked to be behaving aggressively out of fear. And that could include, oh, I see a dog, man, I throw a rock at it, I see a dog, man, ha, hey, get out of here, trying to treat it like a bear, like, hey, bear, hey, bear, you know, you, you're doing aggressive things that are perceived as aggressive to this creature. To you, you're just trying to defend yourself and figure out what the hell to do, but the perception to it is that you're being aggressive. Now, here is where the tactics and behaviors really, really diverge, and you'll see it. You go, you get the normal stalking, you get the normal flanking, but this is where your vocalizations come in. And those vocalizations are divided into a couple of things. The growl, um, which is that um, the growl has been known to, and the, the roar, both have been known to send out very strong vibrations that stun people, like leave them confused. But then there's the other vocalization, which is the screeching, which I think someone released a video of it and there was this argument about it couldn't have been dog man blah 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 but i've heard that screeching over and over and over again um and and phone like little snippets of audio from witnesses and they didn't know what it was and i was like no that's a dog man right so you get vocalizations you get revealing and then that revealing goes to strong eye contact and impressions uh and facial expressions you know showing the teeth showing their arms making sure that you see their claws moving their hands to where to draw your attention to certain body parts from there in the woods you go into herding you will start to be herded meaning they're now intimidating you and moving you in a desired direction and if you're out there in like a national forest or in some very dense woods alone camping and you find yourself being herded deeper into the woods especially after you've taken a shot at one of these things or you've even pointed a weapon at one of these things and you find yourself being herded deeper and deeper in the wrong direction, you need to stop and make a stand right then and there and fight and try and get out of there. Don't allow yourself to be continue, uh, continually be herded deeper and deeper into the woods. You, you may not ever come back out of that. Um, and that herd typically leads into an ambush. Those ambushes 
are incredibly creative. When I say they're incredibly creative, um, the two gentlemen that I talked to who were ambushed here and the big, the big woods, the ambush was insane. It was not only had they been flanked on both sides, they were being herded from the back and then had been flanked on both sides. And imagine you're headed through the woods, walking straight. You're afraid of what's behind you, but there's something in the trees directly ahead of you. And then there's, they're angling in on, let's say this is 90 degrees. Let's say this is 90 degrees going forward. And then they're angling in on at your 45 degree mark. And then if this is 90, let's just go negative 45 degree mark from looking straight ahead of you. So if you go 45 degrees to your right, 45 degrees to your left, which would be a negative 45 degrees. And then split that difference of that 45 degrees down to 22.25 or whatever it's going to be in the trees there. Like literally something behind you and it's closing in on all angles. The only direction you can run is completely right or left. Like you can't go forward because you're trapped. You can't go back. The direction you can go is right or left. And they felt like, and they believed that that was designed to split the two of them up. You know, after extensive conversation, and these guys are like real hunters. They was like dark waters, like that was created to split the two of us up. It was intentionally done to split us up. And it almost worked, but out of fear, they stuck together. Um, so the tactics of ambushing is something that you really need to be mindful of. If it's combined with everything else here, if it's combined with, you know, the stalking, just just think of it as like a progression. Okay, I'm in the woods. I have my weapon. I pointed at this thing. Now it's stalking me. Now I hear it moving off and it's flanking me. I've heard vocalizations or screeching and roaring. It showed itself to me. When it showed itself to me, it made eye contact with me. It gave me impressions or gave me expression, showed its teeth, um, brought attention to its claws or its arms or its ears. And now I'm being herded. And if you get to the point to where all those checks, you know, the boxes are checked, and you're being herded, didn't know you're being herded into an ambush, right? Hold on one second. Sorry about that, guys. I wanted to light the cigar without y'all having to hit a lighter. Uh, I'm going to take care of your 503 error of the day. I have to get my, um, one of the many things that went wrong over the past 14 days is my old cell phone just all of a sudden just went dead and wouldn't charge. And so I have to add all my email accounts back to my phone because I would fix the 503s on my phone. Like the minute you email me with a 503 error and I saw it, I would just log in and fix it. So I'll be taking care of all that today. Um, okay, so the scenario number five, we're going into the wetlands, into the swamps, and this is where it gets very, very, um, to me, this is the worst terrain to encounter a dog man on. It really, really is. Um, because of their ability to use absolutely, I mean, absolutely use the water in a way that you would not anticipate them using it. And because in the lexicon of dog man, um, because we've been infiltrated with so many fake ass bullshit stories and they mimic other stories um, and accounts that mimic other accounts. Some of the truer accounts are not bleeding through, which leaves this gap in information when it comes to wetlands and swamps. I mean, it really, really does. And the behavior in these wetlands and swamps, if you think about it, go back and listen to all the little podcasts and stories and blah, there's not many of them. Like you may find creepy pastas, just throw that out. Because you know we know creepy pastas are intended for what they what they are. It's not considered to be real. But when you even go into the quote unquote true accounts and encounters, you find very few of them um, that involve the wetlands and the swamps, where naturally this is one of their their natural uh, places that they live. All right. Anyway, moving forward. Again, remember the conditions are. This is an unintentional counter. You still, you know, you didn't go out there looking for them. Um, you are a hunter or an outdoorsman. You do have a weapon on you. You're not really a person who, you know, is 
I, I'm looking for dog man. I know what a dog man is. You just out and minding your business. You just so happen to have a weapon on you, and you you know how to use it. Um, everything pretty much stays the same, but when we start getting to, you're still going to experience the same stalking. Um, but the flanking and the submersion is where it gets extremely frightening. And what I mean by that is this. In the swamps, the flanking is a little bit differently. It's flanking from tree to tree um, with a combination of submersion into the water. So scenario is probably the best thing to explain it, the best way to explain it to you. You're in the swamps, um, you were on your boat, you got off and you went on land. Let's say you're hog hunting and you're deep in the swamps. You're moving across the land, it's bayous um, and waterways all around. So you're on a solid piece of land, but there's a waterway on your right-hand side, a waterway on your left-hand side. Your boat is behind you, which is on a waterway. You're moving through the woods and you're stalking a, I don't know, let's say you're stalking a hog or you're trying to hunt. These things are moving in the trees in the bayous and the swamps. Like not just in the tree, but moving from tree to tree. Not even setting foot on the ground. And I have eight accounts of this. Uh, one account where a guy's experienced this four times. Um, that area where he experienced it now has just been devastated uh, because of all these hurricanes. But he experienced it four times. Um, and the reason why I'm able to confidently speak about this is because he broke his encounter down to the point to where it was damn near scientific the way he thought about it. And, it, and the reason why he got to that point is because it happened over and over and over again and it scared the shit out of him. So he just, he had to like think through it in order for him to even be able to go back out to make a living. So he had to sit down and literally think about it. Anyway, moving forward. So you're in, you're in that scenario, water on all sides, land, you're on land. Um, you're moving. They move from tree to tree. And as he moved, in his example, in his case, as he moved from one side of that landmass to the other side, stalking and looking for the hog, <clears throat> he started to hear something jumping into the water, like kabloosh. And there's a distinct difference in sound between an alligator sliding into the water um, and something jumping into the water. And like he told me, he said, you know, at first I thought it was alligators going into the water. He's like, alligators slide, though. He was like, you know, and it's, it's brush back there, and I'm making sure I'm stumping around hard to um, to run off the gators and uh, and make sure that they know I'm there because gators don't want to just attack you. They rather avoid you unless you just run upon a real hungry gator. He's like, but gators slide into the water and makes a different sound. He's like, I'm used to the sound of a gator sliding into the water. He said, but this was a kabloosh into the water. Um and what he found himself, the scenario he found himself in was being cut off from his boat. Not only being cut off from his boat from the tree, but being cut off from this boat um, as far as like crossing over a bayou to go to another one to actually get in the water and swim back around to his boat. And that's how afraid he was. So it, again, put your hand in front of you and spread your fingers. The three fingers that are pointing forward are the water, the land that you're on, the finger on your right hand side, or your thumb, and then your other finger, whichever way you want to use it. The the extreme, the extremity fingers are the waterways which are around you. He's moving across, left to right, and he hears a kabloosh into the water as he's going towards, you know, whatever finger it is of using your left hand moving towards your thumb. And he realizes that something has jumped into the water. But as he's now realizing it's not an alligator and it damn sure ain't no boar, it's something weird. And he wants to backtrack back to the boat and get out of there. Now there's one in a tree. And so now he's trying to work to the other side of the bayou, which will be your opposite side to get into the water and either go into the other piece of land and swim around or just trying to get away, swim back around to the boat. And he found himself boxed in on all angles to where he had no choice but to go forward. And that's the hurting that we're talking about. Now, in his case, he didn't get the growling and the roaring. He did get the screeching. And he did eventually get the, them revealing themselves to him to the point to where he could see them. Now, in his case, the conclusion that he's come to is that that area where he liked to go do his hunting um, was just an area he didn't need to be in because they actually let him out of the area. So he came to the conclusion that was an area he didn't need to be in. And 
I, and I, in my opinion, he got extremely lucky. Uh, my saw my notifications. I'm trying to see. You guys still with me? In the chat. Kind of hard to tell because nobody, people talking about all kinds of stuff. Okay. All right. Good. So for those of you who are outdoorsmen, again, if you find yourself in, in wetlands, swamplands, marshes, and you start observing these behaviors, then you want to look for the stalking is the first behavior, but you want to look for number one, look for the flanking and a submersion, meaning have in your mind that, okay, if this is what I think it is, if there, I don't know if you saw signs, let's say you saw a gigantic canine prince, man, what the hell are they doing out here? Oh, they're cutting trees down. If you saw a gigantic canine prince and you was like, okay, well, this is probably a dog man in this area. Get the hell out of there. Number one, but number two, if you, you're still in that area and you find yourself experiencing these things, any one of these, the flanking, the submersion, the hurting, the vocalizations, specifically growls and roars, which are way more aggressive than a screeching, um, they show themselves to you and then you find yourself being herded into an ambush or herded, just anticipate that there's an ambush coming your way. Um, if water's around, be mindful of that water and understand that it will come out of the water and snatch your ass. Just be mindful, but remove yourself from that equation. The only way to actually handle this is to get the hell away from it. Like there's conversations with people on blogs and stuff, you know, this 308 and this 50 cal round will do this and do that. And it's great to speculate that stuff. It really is. I mean, it's great for speculation, but the simple fact is that in order for you to actually have that type of weapon, have that type of um, ammunition, experience the stress that you would be under seeing something like this that you've never seen before and hopefully you will never see again. And then being able to shoot accurately and perform under those circumstances, there are very few men who can do that. I mean, as a man, you have to be trained to perform under those under extreme circumstances just to you know participate in any type of military operation you take your standard military operation and throw that out the window because you're fighting a freaking monster dude you know you you're just lying to yourself right so let that whole thing go it's good for speculation but it's just not good to try and do all right scenario six in the final scenario which is um rural and residential um outskirts of suburban areas where you're 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 a little bit more rural than you're, you're not downtown in any condos, or anything like that. Again, near forests, rivers, and, and uh, farmland. Again, the conditions are that a weapon is involved. It has been shot or you've, you've shown the weapon or you've shown some aggressive behavior towards these creatures. This is where you find yourself getting into some of the more frightening things. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've never spoken about before. Um, on my channel at all. Now, this has the the home the the encounters associated with people's houses really do have a specific pattern to them, and it starts with revealing. And then you know, normally you would think it would start with them stalking, but no, it literally starts with re them revealing themselves to you showing themselves to that person, that homeowner or that landowner. And then it escalates from revealing to peeping and looking through windows. From peeping, it goes into the phase of stalking where it's looking at you through three through trees or from trees. And depending on how aggressive it is, you'll have things like, you know, them on top of your roof. You'll have things like them like digging under your house, under your foundation. Um, and I have a lot of accounts of them being on roofs and 
especially the digging that that is insane and these are things like these are encounters that i just i have never gotten around to um producing and producing them some of them i do have permission to put out others i don't but this is just the data points anyway moving forward from there you get into the vocalizations and once you get to that vocalization phase at your property and it, and you may get to that vocalization phase without even knowing that um, you've been, you know, they've been peeping on you or they've been stalking. You may have shown themselves to you. You may not have noticed them looking through windows or looking through doors. You may have not noticed them, you know, digging around outside. Now, of course, you're going to notice them digging under your house or walking on your roof. I would hope you would. But um, some of the stalking things, I mean, some of the peeping, you may not see. The stalking, you should definitely see. But once you get to that vocalization phase, now you want to really, really start paying attention to what's going on around you. Because the next thing is, it's always, and it's always been um, the attempts to invade the home. And what I mean by that is, you know, the twisting of the doorknobs, um, taking out light bulbs, uh, turning cameras, um, removal and slashing of screen windows. Um, and in extreme cases, um, ramming into the side of the house, like very, very extreme cases. Um, now, why? they do this i've come to believe that if you as a homeowner or a property owner in the revealing phase where they show themselves to you if you leave them the hell alone then you'll be fine i think that just allow follow my brain for a second right hand in the air left hand in the air both of your palms facing you right over here in your right hand is the dog man werewolf whatever the hell you want to call it whatever makes you more comfortable right over here in your left hand is a little figurine of you there are factors in on each side that dictate how the encounter is going to go out or how it's going to play out they're going to do what they consistently do and this is what i'm showing you these are things that they consistently do so the variation in behavior is really not on them the variation in behavior is how you react to them so if you see a dog man or you see this gigantic, which doesn't make sense, but people do it. You see this gigantic nine foot tall walking wolf that's muscular um, with a gigantic mane and a huge hump on his back and large ears. And you decide you should shoot at it. Then you immediately escalate that behavior and you move through the rest of these phases. Right. If you decide, OK, that's something I shouldn't be messing with. I'm going to go ahead and leave that the hell alone and back away then there's a greater chance. It doesn't guarantee. There's a greater chance it's going to go on about his business. Now, there's been encounters where people have done that and still acted a fool. So I'm not guaranteeing you anything. I'm just saying there's a greater chance. And in this scenario, you really want to just survive this. You don't want that kind of stuff hanging around your house and bothering you and your family and killing your dogs. All right, anyway, so we get to the attempted home invasion phase, which is doorknob turning, light source manipulation, camera manipulation. And it doesn't really make much sense um, why they do this when they have the ability to actually come into the house and get you if they want to. Um, and I think, I believe, I think, I believe this attempted home invasion phase where they're starting to meddle with your home and touch things, I think that that also is dictated by your reaction um, to them. Like, it's almost like a tick for tack thing. In a lot of cases, when we got to this attempted home invasion part, it was a homeowner who encountered the dog man, initiated an aggressive reaction with them. They came back, initiated a, another aggressive reaction with the homeowner from a tree or growling or screeching or, um, or roaring. Then the homeowner went out into their territory into their woods looking for them and went and tried to find them and then they came back to the house so it's one of those things like you did this i do this you did this i do this and, it's, and it escalates uh and until it gets to the point of a full home invasion which is rare but i have had people who tell me what i believe to be true stories about real home invasions um but i believe the reason why i label it as rare is because there's no way um that that true data set of, you know, a monster coming in people's houses is going to be revealed to the public. I mean, there's literally no way. 
Uh, Jeff Nataloni, who's a good friend of mine, Jeff has done some great work in dissecting. Um, has done some really great work in dissecting the news articles and the stories about some very strange and mysterious deaths and disappearances that could be associated with dog man. I don't really care to dig deeper into the home invasion portion of it when there's somebody else who's out there. And when you talk about home invasion and, and we talk about bloody attacks, you can throw that in there as well. I don't really care to dig much deeper into that, but when someone else is doing it, because it doesn't make sense for two good researchers to be researching it. Um, I can have Jeff on to talk about it if you guys like. I'm pretty sure he'll come over and talk about some of the things that he's found. Um, but I, in my opinion, that's rare. And it's not necessarily rare because of the behavior of, behavior of them. It's rare because of the access to the information. If a dog man came through your back door and snatched your ass out of your house you're not, and, and took you off into the woods and ate you, um, there is no way I'm going to know about it. There's no real way I'm going to know about that person who was taken. Just like um, the people who've been taken in the woods while they're hiking and all that stuff. There's no way of quantifying that because they're gone. Only thing we have are the people who had the near death experiences and the near miss experiences. Those are the only information and data points that we can gather from. Those people who've been taken, we don't freaking know. We don't have any information on that. All right. So that is, was that the last one? Yeah, that's it. I wanted to put that out for you guys. Um, I'll take a few questions and then I'll get to working on um, and releasing this other dog man encounter for YouTube, which, um, which happened earlier this year on the outskirts while well, actually in Cook County, Texas. Um, when the when they had that snowstorm, which is a very terrifying encounter that left um three houses of three houses in one neighborhood, all the people were hiding in one house together. That's how terrifying it was. Um any questions? <laughs> Someone's asking about OBS. I'm uh, uh, I'm almost done with OBS, honestly. Um, someone wants to know if Bigfoot and Dog Man are hunting each other. I, I mean, there's really no way to know. Um, I've had stories where people have encountered Bigfoot and Dog Man in the same area. But I, I've only had, you know, one years ago where there was like they were actually going at it. Um, someone wants to know about Anubis. But I think Anubis was a real dog, man. I think Anubis was a a Nephilim. Uh, any dog, man, Bigfoot's reports near Jacksonville, Florida. I'm trying to figure out where the hell Jacksonville is. I'll answer that one in the in the um in the comment section. Are there creatures also in the uh, SoCal area? I don't have many reportings from California at all. I'm pretty sure people have. I just don't get a lot of people from California that reach out to me. Um. Yeah, I heard that interview with the guy who said he had Dog Man as a pup. That was actually on Dog Man Cams. I don't know. I don't. I don't believe anybody can have a Dog Man as a puppy. But if a man has the right to tell his story, um, and you have to judge for yourself what you believe or not. Uh, do I think Dog Man activity will increase or decrease post Ida? I'm not sure about that. I know everything is tore the hell up, like to a point to where if I was them, I would take another goddamn route. And also you have human beings in areas that 
they wouldn't normally be right now, especially like, um, you know, power line company crews and workers, they're way out in the middle of, you know, the woods trying to, to reinforce things and clear right away and cut back trees. So, I mean, I think that activity may slow down a little bit. I don't look into the cover-up stuff. Um, probably a situation where uh, nine four one. Uh, hand over. Da, 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 da. Prophet Yang, I got that story done. I can do that. I can release that story on imdogwaters.com about the guy who saw the freaking humanoid flying. Uh, somebody talk about the elders. Okay. So I'll be back in a couple of hours with the next piece of content members. Um, you have a couple of nice ones coming your way. Let me see here. You have a crossroads demon story. You have you're going to get the lights out dog man encounter first. Then you have like four or five more stories. And then you have Unk. The other two parts of Unk that are coming your way. So you guys got a lot coming. Everybody's got a lot of crap coming, man. I'm not playing. I'm not joking around. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I love you. It's been an hour. I need to give me some lunch. I wanted to get that information out to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I will be talking. Don't worry, because I do an interview with... You one day do big for a dog, man, rape human women to behave differently. Uh, I interview with anybody, bro. The, you just got to send me an invite. Um, as far as raping women, there's only really been one story about that, and that came from um, the Bigfoot Outlaws about four years ago. And I think it was a Bigfoot or a dog, man, raping a woman. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'll catch up with you guys later. Peace.